those who are not familiar with Zoom, um, at the bottom of your screen or on the center, um, depending on if you're on the online platform or on the Zoom um, functionality desktop, um, there should be a chat feature. That is where we're going to use um, to ask questions of our panelists um, and field questions from the attendees. Um, as you can see, we have quite a few attendees on this webinar, so I do ask that you remain muted um, if you are not speaking, um, including our presenters, so that we can have a clear audio for our speakers when they're on. Um, for the chat function, we are going to um, field questions from that. Um, and because of timing and the fact that we have a panel, we're gonna answer all the questions at the end. So if you see questions, um, some of our speakers might be able to answer them in the chat um, and otherwise we'll collect them and use them in the panel discussion that's gonna be at the end of today. And speaking of the panel discussion, this is kind of a rundown of what's gonna happen. So you're hearing from me, you will get a welcome from Christine Kahn at the Department of Natural Resources, and then Rachel Lamb from MDE and Elliot Campbell from DNR, who have both been integral in helping to get these um, webinar series off the ground and, and facilitated. Um, we'll be giving a really quick recap of the first webinar, which was accounting for Maryland's blue carbon, and the second webinar, which was financing mechanisms um, around blue carbon and ecosystem services. And then we're gonna dive right into our presentations. Um, we have quite a bit of content to cover and discussion to hopefully foster. So this is kind of the way we're gonna go. We do have a 10 minute break planned in there and we will honor that 10 minute break. Um, and so we're gonna do our best to stick on time along the whole thing. And then at the end, you'll see from 3.50 to about 4.25, we're gonna have that panel discussion. So I encourage you to share your questions via the chat. If you have any technical difficulties, you can either direct message um, Rachel Lamb or myself, or just put them in the general chat. We'll be monitoring it all. So with that, um, I'm gonna hand it, I lost my mouse, hand it over to Christine Kahn. Um, and then Rachel, if you can pin her instead of me, if that's possible, um, and we'll have Christine give us our welcome, and then I'll take it back over and introduce our first speakers. All right, thank you, Allison. Um, and thanks to all of you who are joining us today. I was just keeping a check on the participant number and we are five away from a grand 100, um, which just really um, provides a lot of testament to how important and informative these webinars are. Um, so as Allison pointed out, uh, this is this is third in a series of blue carbon opportunities in Maryland, and it's an extremely critical and um, great opportunity to, to start looking at how living shorelines and blue carbon work together. And it's an important element of our climate commission working groups and others working to further this um, these efforts in Maryland. I think that this webinar is exciting. I know that the first two webinars dealt with accounting for blue carbon um, and then the second on financing. This is all about how to get those projects in the ground, the challenges, the opportunities, and um, something that I think all of us appreciate is uh, those co-benefits. Living Shorelines provide such a tremendous benefit to coastal ecosystems from a resiliency perspective, protecting communities, sustaining coastal ecosystems, providing habitat, protecting infrastructure, and then generating these blue carbon benefits. So it really is, you know, not just a win-win, but a triple win or a quadruple win. So it's, it's exciting to be part of this. It's exciting to see this um, group of experts across the state of Maryland come together and, and provide this learning opportunity for all of us. So I thank all of the speakers for giving us your time today. Um, it's very generous and I know that we'll learn a lot. Thank you for bringing that to us. And thank you also uh, to Allison and Rachel for I think doing the bulk of this work, pulling it together. Um, Elliot and Nicole, I know that you were instrumental too in pulling together all of our speakers. So thank you very much to the work, uh, the webinar organizers for um, bringing this to us. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Allison. Thank you, Christine. Um, and sorry for those um, who might have been distracted by the flashing slides. Um, my webpage refreshed unexpectedly and then had an issue. So sorry about that. Um, but I'm gonna hand it right over um, to Wesley Gold 
and Nicole Carlozo from the Maryland Department of Natural Resources um, to give us our first presentation. Um, Wesley, Allison, we can, um, before we do that, maybe Elliot and I could provide a quick uh, oh, overview of I'm the so previous sorry. webinars. Yes. And then we'll, we'll go ahead and get started with our first speakers. That'd yes. be great. So maybe Elliot, we can start with you. Great. <clears throat> Thanks, Rachel. So I thought the, the first webinar was a, an excellent kickoff uh, to this series. <clears throat> It was about accounting for, for blue carbon. So we laid out uh, the state of the science around blue carbon, some of the some emerging projects, and then discussed and uh, how how that science can be applied to Maryland, both in our um, greenhouse gas accounting and inventory, and then our planning for uh, future goals, meeting our greenhouse gas reduction goals and, and how blue carbon uh, factors in there. So again, I was, I was really pleased with it. I think um, I, I know I got a lot out of it. I hope others did too. Uh, just a quick thank you to our speakers, Brian Needleman from University of Maryland College Park, Pat McGonigal and James Holmquist from CERC, um, Katie Warnell from Duke. Who, all of those were, were presenters and uh, gave excellent presentations. So I'll pass it over to, to Rachel. Well, similarly, uh, we had a really great panel discussion around uh, innovative financing mechanisms to make sure that we're incentivizing ongoing protection and restoration of blue carbon ecosystems. Of course, uh, uh, there's a lot of um, kind of complicated levers that we could pull to incentivize the work. And so we spent a lot of time talking about different categories of both funding and financing with, of course, funding being an example of a one-way transfer of resources or monies to support a given program or project. You might think about this like grant funding or revenue that's generated by the entity doing the project. We then compare that to different types of financing opportunities, which implies a two-way relationship. Uh, you might think about this as an acquisition of money through environmental bonds or loans. And if we consider the range of different opportunities, how uh, the state or uh, an entity interacting with the state might see uh, this financing as a portfolio. So you can think about different levers you might pull at different times to make a given project more cost-effective and uh, how carbon credits, whether that be just for carbon sequestration, like you might access in the context of a voluntary market, or carbon credits alongside a range of other environmental co-benefits, such as crediting uh, for resilience or nutrients, might be uh, pulled together, uh, again, as part of a comprehensive portfolio to really uh, make this work scalable and um, also make sure that people are thinking about it as um, the carbon piece as one of many pieces to really um, make these projects happen. Um, we also thought a lot about, um, again, co-benefits co and thinking about how we can really scale car um, climate and environmental outcomes and really doing it in support of state goals, but also making sure that we're able to quantify and track them, linking back to the initial webinar that, that Elliot mentioned, uh, and just recognizing that there's so much growth, um, not just in the voluntary market, but uh, Maryland already participates in a compliance market. We already participate as part of the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative on wild land-based or, or um, in this case, maybe water-based carbon or, or tidal system carbon isn't included as something that's directly traded in that system. Uh, there's a range of opportunity to think about how blue carbon could be included in a compliance market like that moving forward. So lots of great detail there, just like with the accounting webinar, we, we've posted both of the videos and we really encourage you to go back and listen to them. And uh, we know that these speakers uh, today are gonna really build on a lot of that work and maybe even help refresh our thinking about it in terms of practical uh, implementation. Thank you, Rachel and Elliot. Um, and as Rachel mentioned, those webinars are posted online um, and this webinar recording will be as well. Um, so now that we've heard those updates um, and we're back um, on track and I'm following the agenda this time, I'm gonna hand it over to Wes and Nicole from the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. And don't forget, put your questions in the chat for our speakers, please. Can you all see that? Yep, we see your legislation supporting. Right. Oh, there we go, cover slide, you're good. Sneak peek, sorry about that. 
Um, all right, so my name is Wesley Goulds. I'm with the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. Um, I'm the acting section chief for the Shoreline Conservation Service. Uh, many of you all know Baskar, um, who has since left us for NOAA, um, but it's still been involved. So he's been um, a great asset to the team. Um, so I'm working as part of that program to um, kind of oversee our, our loan program and um, just, uh, yeah. So anyway, let's get started. I'm going to turn this off so I don't get any flashing. So a bit of background about the Shoreline Conservation Service. Um, our group was established in 1968 as part of the shoreline erosion control law. Um, our staff provides technical and fiscal assistance to waterfront property owners who are experiencing erosion. Um, we provide site evaluations and helps develop a plan. Um, from there, we would connect these folks to the appropriate funding sources and project partners. Um, these are folks like um, eligible funding entities would be like NGOs, and local governments um, that are willing to sponsor these type of projects. Um, so these are really the group, boots on the ground folks that really do the heavy lifting uh, to see these projects through completion. So what is a living shoreline? Um, outlined is the department's definition, but in summary, um, a living shoreline is basically a suite of erosion control techniques that are used to minimize coastal erosion while maintaining coastal process. That's important. Um, the suite of techniques can include the use of anything from oyster castles and core fiber logs um, to things like sills, groins, breakwaters. Um, and these, these techniques are used to protect, restore, enhance, or create natural shoreline habitat. Um, the photos attached are a project completed in 2017 at Assateague Island State Park, um, adjacent to the boat ramp facility right before you go over the Verrazano Bridge. Um, this one was sponsored by the Maryland Coastal Bays Program, who you'll hear from in a minute. Um, in this case, we're actually creating a new marsh in order to protect the existing marsh complex located directly behind it. Maryland's been pretty progressive and is one of the leaders in the country when it comes to living shorelines. Um, Part of this reason is this 2008 Living Shorelines Protection Act, um, which became law in 2008, but was implemented. Um, the regulations were implemented in 2013, and the law basically states that a living shoreline is required or a non-structural shoreline erosion control technique is required um, unless the property owner can demonstrate that, that it's not feasible at the site. Um, so shorelines in Maryland, this is just a high level overview. Uh, 6,659 is our best guess. Don't hold me to that miles of shoreline. Um, 84 to 85% of which are privately owned, which you know can be quite a hurdle when it comes to our goal of restoring these shorelines back to their natural state. Um, over 50% of Chesapeake Bay shoreline is hardened and these impacts of erosion affect all 16 coastal counties. But erosion is not always a bad thing. Um, it's a natural process that maintains beach, marsh, and offshore habitats. Um, it's a process that's critical to uh, restore the estuary. Um, so erosion is uh, accelerating due to the, the hardening of shorelines and increased boat traffic along with the impacts of sea level rise and coastal storm events. So pen to paper, this is the Astig project again. Um, you can see the design plan here at the bottom. A few design considerations when you're thinking about designing a living shoreline. Um, you can see the, the marsh that it's protecting right there near the um, parking lot and the uh, facilities. And there's an SAV bed located directly offshore. Um, so we really had to squeeze this in between, um, you know, two critical resources, the SAV as well as this tidal marsh complex. Um, and we even managed to treat some storm water um, by one, holding the water from one of the dunes uh, directly behind the project. So it looks a little bit different nowadays, but highly suggest you check it out. Um, if you're ever down in this area, there's even oysters um, that are starting to inhabit the breakwaters. Um, so definitely a neat site. 
So um, a bit of the evolution of the shoreline erosion control techniques. How did we get from the picture on the left to the picture on the right? Um, you know, these techniques have really evolved in the last, really the last 10 to 20 years um, in a lot of improvement. So here's the traditional approach. I'm sure everyone on the call is familiar with. Uh, the bay is littered with these practices. Um, the traditional approach was just to rock it up, stone revetments, wooden bulkheads. You know, that was the historical norm. Um, and as you know, it's, you know, these practices make up the vast majority of the shorelines we see today. The, some of the problems that we run into with these structural approaches um, the wooden bulkheads have limited lifespans, typically about 25 years or so. Um, more common types of, the most common types of failures we see are due to toe scour at the base what? of the bulkhead. Yeah. And the uh, stormwater, stormwater sheet flow up top causing um, erosion and land sloughing on the upland end. So why fight mother nature when you can work with her? And this is one of the fi my favorite visuals that I found um, that really helps bring the message home. Basically the structural solution on top, its strongest day in the ground was the day that it was built. The bottom, the nature-based solution, uh, its weakest point is the day after construction and it only becomes stronger over time. I mean, just look how happy those birds look. Um, so sills, this was the first iteration of living shorelines, um, something still considered to be the bread and butter of living shorelines today by many marine contractors. Um, this practice alone has evolved to become a lower profile with larger gaps over time, um, even using different materials uh, to, hold, to hold the uh, sill together, such as logs or oyster reef balls to really enhance the habitat value of these systems. Um, so when I was pulling together these slides, I was, couldn't help but notice the theme of gaps. So I just wanted to kind of point that out. Um, you know, these are habitat focused projects. That's the goal. Um, you know, a turtle is not going to be able to scale or a vetment like this to get onto the beach um, to use it as a usable space. And on the second picture, you know, he's not going to be able to, he'll be lucky to find that little opening. Um, so since they're habitat focused projects, we need to open the shorelines up for the critters. Um, so Scott Hardaway out of BIMS, he was inst instrumental in expanding the gap through the use of these headland breakwater systems, um, instrumental in developing the practice and implementing it in our Chesapeake Bay region. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this practice, um, see it throughout the Bay. Um, he, he basically, came up with this engineering ratio of about 1.65 to one that'll create a stable crescent beach embayment um, that will accrete sand over time if placed correctly. So the photo on the bottom is of the Rhodes Point project located on Smith Island. Uh, and I think it's a great example of, you know, a living shoreline technique protecting one of these carbon sequestering marshes um, in a really dynamic area of the bay. And then we've since evolved also to a living shoreline, or a, uh, I'm sorry, a shingle beach. So this is Conquest Beach Preserve over in Queen Anne's County. Um, you know, there's not a structure in sight, uh, just the mix of cobble, gravel, and sand. So the, the gaps between these structures have essentially disappeared. Um, and Albert, who you'll be hearing from in a minute, he was the designer on this project and really has championed the technique in the Bay region. Um, this project's located on the Chester River in a fairly high energy environment. Um, it's a riverine type system and it's, it's beautiful. If you get a chance, definitely swing by to check that out. So just like the, show, the shoreline erosion control techniques have evolved over the years, so have the funding sources. Um, the site shown here was recently funded through our re Resiliency Through Restoration Initiative, um, and I'm now going to hand it over to Nicole to talk about her innovative program. Thank you, Wes. 
I think Allison's going to share my slides for me. And just let Great. me know if it flashes, if it's flashing like it was before. It looks okay from my end. Perfect. Okay, great. Um, thank you, Wes. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nicole Carlozo, and I manage the Resiliency Through Restoration Initiative at the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. And this is a state-led restoration project that uses restoration to help enhance community resilience to the impacts of climate change. And so we're working with nature-based approaches like living shorelines to address impacts like erosion, flooding, and sea level rise. So today I'm gonna to be providing a brief overview of the program, which is supporting the design and construction of a number of living shorelines across the state. And some of the photos on the slide here represent projects that we are, or sites for projects that we are currently funding. The upper left-hand corner is at the Westover Methodist Center in Anne Arundel County during construction. The upper right-hand corner is at our site on the Deal Island Peninsula down in Somerset County in the Lower Eastern Shore. And you can see that um, this is a, a nor'easter high tide flood event that's overtopping the shoreline at that site. And then the bottom left hand corner is um, our site at Franklin Point State Park in Anne Arundel County. You can see some of our staff member, members all the way out there that are doing some monitoring. Um, and a number of, you know, a lot of downed trees occur along that site due to erosion. Uh, next slide, please. So we have a number of long-term goals for this program, which are listed here. Uh, broadly across the department, we're working to reduce Maryland's vulnerabilities to climate change. And we're doing that through um, an understand, plan, implement approach. And so we're working with our partners, our local governments and our grantees to better understand their risk, um, to address and plan for addressing that risk, and then to work towards implementation of green solutions or nature-based approaches. And the resiliency program really is focused on that implementation phase and helping our partners and communities implement nature-based practices. We're also working to improve our understanding of the community benefits of these practices. And we're doing that through state-led monitoring and community-led monitoring. We're monitoring things like, uh, or elements like vegetation, elevation, sediment, and wildlife at these sites. And then over the long term, we're also working to elevate the use of and the understanding of where these practices are feasible and where they are practical. And so to support this goal, we're actually currently partnering with George Mason University's Flood Hazards Research Lab, and we're partnering with the Nature Conservancy through a NOAA funded project. And I've linked that project at the bottom of this slide. We're really working with those partners to monitor these sites and better quantify the wave attenuation benefits and the flood reduction benefits of um, natural features like marshes and seagrass, and also looking at nature-based features like living shorelines. So uh, feel free to visit that site if you'd like more information. Um, and then lastly, we're working to demonstrate and encourage public-private partnerships. We're really working to leverage local funding, state funding, and federal funding uh, to advance project implementation on the ground and get as many pilot projects on the ground as possible. Next slide, please. Um, so in order to reach these longer term goals, we've also developed a short term goal of demonstrating how living shorelines can help enhance community resilience to climate change. Um, and so to reach the short term goal, we're implementing pilot projects. And we had an original uh, goal of implementing at least 15 projects through this pilot program. We're currently working on 22 projects and they are in various phases of design and construction. And the program can support design, construction and adaptive management at these sites. And every year we are uh, soliciting projects and identifying projects through DNR's annual grants gateway solicitation. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just um, an image of our annual solicitation. For our resiliency program, we uh, identify projects through outcome three, which uh, is described as using natural and nature-based infrastructure to enhance resilience to climate change. And these grants um, 
well, local governments and nonprofits are both eligible to apply for these grants for design or construction for living shoreline or nature-based practices. Um, we can fund any projects that include na na nature-based elements um, such as wetlands, uh, forest buffers, dunes, uh, living shorelines. We can also fund green infrastructure practices that address stormwater quantity. So, so practices like rain gardens or uh, bioretention facilities. And really the focus here is on um, helping communities that are impacted by water. Um, so there's a focus on water quantity, whether that's coastal flooding issues or precipitation induced flooding um, or erosion issues. And this is different from some of our other funding sources that focus more on water quality benefits. Uh, next slide, please. So we utilize a number of data um, and mapping resources to help target uh, sites for these resilience projects. And one of those resources is Maryland's Coastal Resiliency Assessment. We use this as a screening and prioritization tool and it's available online um, on DNR's uh, Coastal Atlas, which is our online mapping platform for coastal data. And this assessment helps us to more proactively identify and target conservation and restoration opportunities that can help um, reduce vulnerable vulnerabilities for communities and help communities adapt to climate change. So I don't have time to go into the details of this assessment today, but feel free to look online for more information. And our online um, mapping platform also has other data sets that are available to help with uh, evaluating sites for living shorelines. And this includes a historic erosion rate and shoreline data sets, as well as floodplain and sea level rise data. Uh, next slide, please. So every year through our solicitation, we work to select projects that represent different types of practices, different geographies, and different types of communities. And projects are selected based on a number of factors which are listed here, but I wanted to highlight a few, other, uh, a few of them for the group today. Uh, the first being exposure reduction. So we're really focused on funding projects that reduce exposure to or reduce exposure for community infrastructure or community assets. We're also working to um, fund projects that mac maximize ecological enhancement um, that demonstrate innovations within living shoreline practices um, and that have demonstration value. So pro projects where we can bring folks to, um, to demonstrate different types of practices for different types of communities. We're also working to prioritize projects that are connected to local plans. And so this means uh, projects um, or sites are identified in nuisance flood plans, hazard mitigation plans, green infrastructure plans, or are part of some larger resilience effort within a community. And so that we understand how these projects fit together to make a community more resilient to climate change. And for our living shoreline projects, we do require that our grantees work with the designer to incorporate the state's sea level rise projections into the design. And those projections were released in 2018 by the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science, and they are updated every five years. Uh, next slide, please. So I wanted to just show a few of the projects that are um, either have, have either recently been implemented or that are currently within uh, currently working where we're currently working on construction. And the first project to be constructed through this program was the West River Methodist Center project that uh, Wes actually mentioned earlier. This is in Anne Arundel County and we worked with the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay and the West River Methodist Center on this project. Um, this project is unique in that it addresses uh, coastal and stormwater impacts. And so this site had a a bulkhead that was deteriorating and it basically had lawn all the way out to the bulkhead. And so we worked with our partners to design a living shoreline project um, that has two different living shoreline components. Um, in the forefront of this photo, you'll see the headland breakwater system of, of this living shoreline. Since this photo was taken, those headlands have been vegetated and the sand behind them also has been vegetated. And then to the left of that, you'll see the starts of a cobble beach or shingle beach with which Wes also mentioned uh, earlier. 
Uh, behind that shoreline, you'll see where the construction is taking place. We have uh, two regenerative stormwater conveyance wetland systems. And so we were able to trap and um, help treat stormwater on the site, as well as uh, provide habitat and resiliency benefits along the shoreline. This is a very accessible location we can bring folks to. Um, and uh, the Methodist Center also has a church camp and an environmental education program that they'll, they'll be working to integrate this project into uh, their, their lessons. Uh, next slide, please. Nicole, you have about two minutes. Okay, thanks. All right, so I'm gonna skip over this slide then, but just wanted to show some photos of the ribbon cutting and the planting at the West River Methodist Center. Um, and thank you, Allison. Uh, and then the next project I wanted to highlight is the Deal Island uh, Shoreline Project. This is in Som uh, Somerset County on the Lower Eastern Shore. And you can see from the photos at the top of this slide on the far left-hand side, what this system used to look like. It was a dunal system that was heavily vegetated. And then over time, it lost uh, those dunal features. And now um, during nor'easters and high tide events, the shoreline is overtopped. And so um, the community was very concerned about a shoreline breach happening here, which would increase their vulnerability behind this marsh system. And the site has lost over 230 feet since the 1970s. So we're working right now to construct a living shoreline project here with a dunal restoration component. Uh, next slide, please. This is my last slide. I um, wanted to just share that the next step for this program is a focus on adaptive management, uh, which we're defining as the act of monitoring and adjusting a restoration practice in the face of changing and dynamic conditions. So we all know conditions are changing. Uh, climate change is causing uh, sea levels to rise and have, we have an increase in the intensity and frequency of storm events. And so we're actively working with uh, the Chesapeake Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve and the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science to monitor these sites. And we're working through the Maryland My Coast reporting app to uh, develop a restoration tracker so we can have community scientists help to monitor these sites as well to inform future adaptive management needs or activities. Uh, next slide, please. And that is it. And I will turn things back over to Allison. Thank you. Thanks, Nicole. Um, and I will put the links that Nicole mentioned into the chat um, as soon as our next speaker gets started. I'm going to hand it right over to Tammy Robertson from the Maryland Department of the Environment. Tammy. Thank you. Let me go ahead and share my screen. And in the meantime, my daughter actually uh, every year goes to summer camp at West River. So I look forward to seeing, um, seeing it this summer. All right. You're good. All right. All right. So my PowerPoint presentation is up. Yep, we're seeing it. Okay, great. All right. Um, again, I'm Tammy Robertson. I'm with the Maryland Department of the Environment. I'm the Title Wetlands Division. Um, first and foremost, thanks for inviting MDE to join in today's um, workshop to discuss the regulatory and um, permitting aspect of living shoreline projects. I know the regulatory side is not the most exciting aspect and, and not the aspect that everyone really looks forward to when putting a living shoreline um, into practice but it is a necessary step and it's critical to have um, an understanding of regulations in order to facilitate and expedite the um, permit process. Um, I'll begin by providing some context of where MDE's Tidal Wetlands Division comes into the picture when it comes to living shorelines. Um, as most of the work associated with living shoreline projects typically occur in, um, in tidal waters. Um, MDE's responsible for implementing Maryland's title wetlands law, which includes re regulating both state and private wetlands and also um, stormwater discharges within 1000 um, feet landward of the, the, the title um, boundary. State wetlands include any land under navigable waters of the state, channel word of the mean high water, and then we have private wetlands that are these vegetated areas that are between the mean high water and the mean high high water line. Um, so for this presentation, we'll primarily focus on state um, wetlands. 
All right, so we'll move on to slide two. Um, I think it's important to provide some regulatory context of um, living shorelines in regards to shoreline erosion control measures. You know, Wes spoke briefly about, you know, in February 2013, the Tidal Wetlands Regulations for Living Shorelines formalized the requirements of the Living Shoreline Protection Act that was passed by the Maryland General Assembly during the um, 2008 legislative session. Um, again, as Wes kind of touched on, the key provision of the Living Shoreline Regulations identify improvements to protect a person's property um, against e erosion control must consist of marsh creation or other non-structural shoreline stabilization measures that preserve the natural environment unless a waiver is obtained. And I think Wes and I probably use those <laughs> words ver verbatim. Um, with living shoreline projects, marsh creation can either um, can consist of both um, a high or low marsh um, component. The usual suspects are your you know, um, plants for low marsh, Spartina alternoflora, and then Spartina um, patents for the, the high marsh. Um, but I think it's worth noting um, that projects are not bound by these two types of species. Um, it's highly recommended that surrounding reference wetlands be observed to select the appropriate plant species for the project. I'll say like probably like 90 some percent of all applications that come in have or, you know, only use these two types of species. And, and I, I, I think we wanna get the message out that you, you really aren't bound by those um, um, by those species. Um, a property owner may obtain a waiver to the living shoreline requirement if the project, um, the, the, the shoreline is mapped as in an area appropriate for structural shoreline stabilization measures that are displayed on MDE's website. Currently, the maps include areas that experience eight feet or more of erosion annually. Therefore, there are very few locations identified on these maps. Um, with that said, the maps are actually scheduled to be updated with the first um, updates um, coming out um, projected April of 2022. Um, these maps were created by the Virginia Institute of Marine Science, VIMS, and the first rollout will include um, Anne Arundel County, Calvert, Dorchester, and Talbot County. And then in subsequent years, we'll be adding more um, counties um, to, those, to those maps. Applicants can also um, complete and submit a waiver worksheet to MDE that looks at certain criteria such as fetch, water depth, waterway width, waterway width um, substrate to determine if a living shoreline is practicable. And then also um, if after consulting with a coastal engineer or DNR's Chesapeake and Coastal Services and their expert opinion determines a living shoreline is not practicable, that would also qualify um, a site for a waiver from the living shoreline um, requirement. Um, I just want to highlight the photos in this pre presentation um, that they're actually from a study that was conducted last year by MDE by a Chesapeake Conservation Corps member who evaluated approximately 50 living shorelines um, throughout Maryland. And so these photos kind of represent kind of the day to day projects that are um, authorized on a regular basis by the, um, by the state. Uh, the first step in the application process is to request a pre-application meeting. I can't stress you know, enough the importance of scheduling a pre-application meeting. Um, this is really an opportunity for MDE, the agent, the ad applicant, and depending on how the Corps will process the application, um, it, the Army Corps of Engineers is, is included in this um, pre-application meeting. Um, this meeting allows an opportunity for um, review of the site, discuss the project. Um, this, specifically, this is an opportunity to identify information that will be necessary to complete the application and discuss potential hurdles. Um, prior to conducting the site visit, the location will be screened by MDE for potential resource impacts such as rare and threatened um, or endangered species, SAV, Maryland Historical Trust impacts. When resources will be impacted, it is critical to start the conversation early in the project design and permitting process, as there may be additional justification um, or documentation needed 
such as additional studies and consultation with experts to, to justify the, the resource um, impact that might include documenting kind of that, what is the, up, up, the, what is the ecological uplift that the project will provide to the area to kind of offset or justify those resource um, impacts. So let's have those conversations early to prevent delays in the permitting process and avoid any potential costs um, to a project too. Um, if your project is very unique um, or will have a significant impact to re resources, scheduling to present at a monthly joint evaluation meeting is highly recommended. Um, this is an opportunity our, it's where the state, federal, and local agencies attend and can provide input specific to your project. Um, these meetings are usually held the last Wednesday of every month, and MDE coordinates those um, virtual meetings. Um, so if you are interested in presenting a project, please reach out. All right, so now we get into the fun stuff. Um, state authorizations um, so are, are classified as two types. We have um, um, or two types um, when state wetlands will be impacted. Um, projects will, will be authorized by either a general license or a wetlands license. Um, MDE has been de delegated the authority from the Board of Public Works to authorize projects that meet the general license criteria, which include living shorelines that are these are the magic numbers that are no greater than 35 feet channelward of the mean high water line, and they don't exceed 500 linear feet. Um, the review of these projects typically take 90 days. Um, they're exempt from the public notice um, process, and um, they can actually be extended for a one-time extension of an additional three years. Um, the one-time extension is a recent regulation change, which occurred at the end of um, June 2021. Um, prior to this, um, general licenses couldn't be extended. Uh, so general licenses in general have less steps in the process than a wetlands license. So this might be something you want to um, consider as you design a, um, as a, something you might want to consider as you're designing um, a, and thinking about a, a, a project. All right, so then we move on to the second type of state um, license. Um, wetlands licenses are required for projects that exceed the general license requirements. So projects that are greater than 35 feet channelward and or longer than 500 linear feet, these projects require public notice. So there is a potential for a public hearing to be requested and held. Um, MDE is responsible for the review of these projects, but at the completion of MDE's review, we prepare and forward a report and recommendation to the Board of Public Works. And so BPW, which is made up of the comptroller, governor, and treasurer, they actually vote on the, um, the project. So they're, they, they're the ones that actually do the approval or not approving of the, the project. Um, and those meetings are held um, typically twice a, a month. Um, and then BPW will then um, issue the, the authorization. And this process takes um, 240 um, days, typically the, 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 the review, um, state review time. All right, so that's kind of the, the, the state side of things. And then um, we'll talk um, a little bit about the, we'll move on to the kind of the Army Corps of Engineers um, categorization, categorization, categorization of living shoreline projects. Um, when the joint permit application, or otherwise known as the JPA, is, um, is used to apply for both the federal and state authorization for work in tidal waters, the application is submitted to MDE, and then depending on the extent of impacts to tidal resources, MDE um, um, may issue the core um, permit or will forward the application for core review. Um, projects that fall under the Maryland State Programmatic General Permit, otherwise known as the GP6, are low-risk activities that will either qualify as a Category A or a Category um, B activity. Um, category A activities, they do not require core review, and the application um, will not be forwarded to the core. 
Um, category B activities require core review and the core will coordinate um, those activities with appropriate federal and state uh, agencies. Um, so the table here gives you an idea of uh, Living Shoreline projects that are less than 500 um, linear feet and less than 35 uh, feet channel word qualify as a category A that matches up with the state's um, general license. And then projects that exceed that category A and are less than 50 feet channel word are category B and the Corps will, um, will issue those um, permits. Uh, any project that exceeds that the category B criteria will be forwarded to the core um, and they will conduct an alternate review where an individual permit will be issued um, by the core. Um, if the project is covered under the GP, um, the, the general permit six, the water quality certification is included with the GP six permit. Um, section 401 certification is required for any federal license or permit that authorizes an activity that may result in a discharge. While activities that are covered under the GP6 have um, WQC coverage, individual permits will require an individual WQC. Um, so an individual WQC requires a WQC request be submitted to MDE in, or, in order for the state to process and issue the water quality certification. I'm sure I have probably lost some of you by now, um, kind of going through that process. So I'm not gonna go into any more details um, regarding the individual water quality certification as um, there's not enough time, but I think it's just worth noting that this is really, that's an additional component that should be considered when planning for the project um, because it is, it's just an, an, an additional step that, that's required. Um, the GP6 um, actually went into effect on October 1st of 2021, so um, I think there's a few changes that are worth noting from the GP5, um, specifically in regards to SAV impacts and beneficial reuse of dredge material associated with living shoreline and beach nourishment activities. So the GP6 now allows for SAV impacts under a category B. There's no specific limits on SAV impacts identified, um, but the project, it, it, the project must um, show that it's been reduced, um, that the SAV um, in, impacts have been reduced um, as much as, as it possibly um, could be. The uh, previous GP permit did not include any beneficial reuse, but is now allowed under a category B activity with a few, with a few caveats. Um, so um, the GP6 now allows for um, some additional impacts that weren't there before, which would trigger it, um, the, the, the project to, to go under that alternate review, um, which is um, for the core, you know, a longer process. So, so, it's a, um, so these changes have, have been a, a helpful, helpful change. All right, so once your project is designed, um, a pre-application meeting you know, was held and you're now ready to submit a complete um, application. Um, you make seven copies of that, that complete applica application and you submit it to regulatory services at, at MDE. If your project is only a living shoreline, then there's no application fee um, associated with its submission. If the project incorporates additional work, then their fees may be, be appropriate. Um, the fee should be mailed to the PO box identified um, on the PowerPoint with the front page of the application attached. Um, as I'm sure a lot of you are aware, the MDE were the clearinghouse for distribution to other resource agencies. So depending on the screening um, and the core categorization, a copy of the application may be forwarded to other agencies such as the Maryland Historic Trust, Department of Natural Resources, CORE, and Critical Area Commission. So hence the, the, the reason for the, 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 the seven copies. All right, I'll share some available resources um, that are available on MDE's website that you can, that can provide some guidance on the, the JPA submission. 
Specifically, there is a JPA step-by-step -step instruction booklet that can assist with ensuring you have all the materials needed prior to your submission, and it provides guidance on completing each section of the application. In addition, the booklet assists with identifying the correct um, you know, additional documents that may be needed, such as the public notice billing form, the critical area buffer notification for, form, um, the buffer management plan, and, and other uh, relative forms that are specific to your project um, activity. So that's, that's a, a helpful, helpful tool. Um, MDE's website also has sample activity guidelines and drawings for specific activities, such as living shorelines. So this includes a, you know, um, this um, document includes a checklist of items that should be included in the submission and, and provides um, sample plans um, too. All right. And then finally, I'll conclude with just providing some helpful links. Um, that are available on MDE's website to kind of help facilitate um, you know, submission of, a, of an application. And again, I, I guess I just want to close with, you know, just reaching out to um, MDE, scheduling a pre-application meeting um, is, is really the, the best recommendation that the, the MDE can provide because it's just, it provides an opportunity to kind of have those, uh, begin having those conversations um, regarding the project and, and site-specific conversations um, to address any kind of hurdles that that, um, that 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 might be there that can be identified early in the in the process and, and addressed early in the process. And I think with that, I can stop sharing. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tammy. Um, okay. Um, thanks for folks who are putting questions in the chat um, and engaging in discussion there. Um, next up, we have Albert McCullough, who is going to um, keep this conversation going. Albert, the floor is yours. Very good. Let me let me share now. Okay, uh, I, I'm I'm uh, uh, going to be talking a little bit more, going back in the big scale, both spatially and time wise, about we're not where seeing we your did. slide yet, Albert. Sorry. Excuse me. You we're can't see it. We're not seeing your slide yet. Nope. Oh, sorry. Let me, let me, uh, I guess, uh, bear with me. Yep, no problem. So, do, 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 do. okay. Now we should be able to see something, right? Does that look better? Nothing. Ah, hold on. I'm sharing screen. Oh, there you go. Oh, there you go. This. Got it. Share. Got it. Go. We're good. Okay, cool. So it's not um, in presentation mode yet, but we are seeing your slides. Okay. So uh, all right. There you We're go. Perfect. Ready to rock and roll. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Got it. Um, okay. So uh, uh, I'm going to quite often we get uh, as human beings, we get uh, looking at the very much the here and now. So I'm going to try to. Uh, basically scale back and look at a larger uh, uh, perspective, both time-wise and also, too, spatially. Uh, so my talk is going to be more, uh, more along those lines, more of a higher scale kind of perspective. And also, too, if you uh, have like more of a longer reach shoreline, how the, or at least I think the thinking process would, uh, would go forward to uh, kind of get into what is the needs out there and how to actually implement the project. So... Uh, going way back in time, uh, this is when uh, the river in Ohio uh, got caught fire and burned to the ground in uh, the Cayuga River, and uh, that's what really precipitated the Clean Water Act. And um, we are all here now because of that, basically, and it's been a, a, quite a journey in itself. So in the 70s, it was pretty much a federal mandate, but then it uh, to get, really got implemented at the, more of the local level. Uh, in the 80s, it was really a re-education for the, the development community, especially, about how, uh, no, you can't build in these areas, or if you do, you have to mitigate. So it was a very much a wild, wild west uh, kind of existence where uh, uh, you, they come in with the plan set and all, you know, all of a sudden you say, oh, no, you can't do this. And then it was really kind of a, a very kind of a crazy time then that we didn't even have a, a delineation method. And most of the times it was uh, the, the, the uh, 
agreements were done on the ground with the reviewer, the local reviewers. And here in Maryland, Baltimore County and Harford County were the, the initial folks, the initial local entities that did that. And so echoing what Tammy was saying, engaging upfront early on and an active communication throughout with your, with your reviewers, but the state, federal and local reviewers goes a long way, it helps out a lot to get these projects going forward and making sure you understand the current policies and how they influence projects. Going into the 1990s, uh, I, I considered the era of a lot of planning and talking and you know, uh, a lot of committees, a lot of uh, we should do assessment methods. Not really much went in the ground in the 90s. I mean, we did have some, but it's not really, uh, wasn't really a, a time where uh, let's get something put in the ground. And that's really the only time when uh, you make a change when you actually have a restoration project or something that's taking care of an environmental challenge or stress uh, in, a, in a proper way. So, and, and you can see it, basically, we had a, quite a bit of wetland assessment methods and all this talk. But then in the 90s or in the 2000s, I think that's where things really started uh, started happening. Uh, at Maryland Department of Natural Resources, I think that what they they really pretty much started, and I'm, uh, kudos to Kevin Smith, because uh, you know I think uh, uh, he, he was the one kind of thread the jungle, uh, actually finding ways to actually get projects implemented. And um, uh, I think uh, all, all of those trials and tribulations has taken years off his life. He should have been dead about 25 years ago, but he's still here with us. So, but anyway, that's where the, I think the project started going in the ground. I, we did have, like as Wes was saying earlier, we did have a, a shoreline program in the, in the 1968, but it was really, I would consider more to be like structural practices, not necessarily like a living shoreline practice. Then uh, going in the, the, the 2010s, uh, then I think really we're hitting momentum now. Uh, we had uh, the watershed groups, they started to come into their own. They're kind of wobbly in their knees early on in their organization. Uh, but now I, I really see some organizational of mojo with all these, all, all these different watershed groups that are actually were able to uh, implement and manage and you know, engage and, uh, and coordinate uh, these projects going to the ground. Uh, and they're becoming, a, I call, you know, basically they're organizationally uh, capacity to actually really make these things happen. But the real thing is, is how do you, how do you kind of balance this? Where you, so when you go out and you initially think about a project, there's really three different uh, circles that we have to be aware of. One is the political part, which is actually the grant funding or community association or private landowner. That's, he falls, they fall within the political circle. And then there's the regulatory part that Tammy was saying, we have to uh, get our, our authorizations to actually make the project happen. And then the other part is the technical part. Is it technically feasible to actually do a project? Will it we'll perform as expected? And all these circles must overlap. So you can actually, you know, so you do have to have, if two of the three overlap, uh, they, no project. For example, you know, like working with community associations, which tend to take um, uh, quite a bit of a, um, encouragement and engagement, uh, sometimes that circle gets a little bit off center away from things. And you really have to work to make sure it comes back in to satisfy both the regulatory and technical pieces. So, um, so for, for that, uh, uh, there's also, you know, for example, let's say uh, the technical and the political part is okay, but uh, the solution does not necessarily fit into the regulatory program. Then we have to work and adapt and try to make things uh, uh, adjusted to make sure we all get together and have a viable project. So uh, in that sense, you know, it's really uh, uh, the two, when you move through the projects, you have to keep these in mind. All right. So what I want to do, uh, we're going to go through some project examples now. And again, this is more at a uh, uh, at more of a larger scale level. So there's three projects uh, I'm gonna be just discussing and for, for the rain, re remainder of my talk. Um, one is the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center. It's located in uh, uh, down in Edgewater, that general area in Anne Arundel County. It's a 4,100 living sh foot shoreline project. Uh, it's right at the, uh, the, the uh, confluence of the Western Roads River. The first project, first phase was constructed in 2012, and we have a second phase going to the ground now, not going in the ground, but we're in the design and permitting phase. Um, that is a, there was talk earlier about tidal freshwater projects, I saw in the chat. So uh, 
that is mostly, I would say, they call it mesohaline, which is probably anywhere from six to maybe 12 parts per thousand, depending on the time of year. Uh, and uh, it, uh, as Tammy was saying, the majority of the projects are mostly in the mid bay. And uh, the, the species you tend to have in the intertidal zone is Sportana ultraflora, and the, and the high more zone is Sportana patens. Both these have salt tolerances up to about 32 parts per thousand. So um, the second project is Northeast Isles. And this is a project uh, way up in the northern part of the bay. And it's a league of hailing, which is essentially, it's fresh water under tidal influence. Really cool systems. They uh, have it up in, uh, uh, in, the, in the river reaches. There's stretches. I live in Denton. There's, I live on a uh, tidal freshwater area. And there was talk about some um, a diversity of plants. Now, it's not saw stressed. You can get all sorts of meat flowering plants like cardinal flower, uh, marsh hibiscus. You can really jazz it up, so to speak. And it's, uh, it, it makes for a nice project. Not too many fringe marshes up there, but still uh, there's opportunities to be had. And the last one is uh, not necessarily a living shoreline project. It uh, has to do with thin layering uh, and, uh, for marsh restoration. It's down on Blackwater National Wildlife Re Refuge. Uh, obviously down, uh, you know, in south of Cambridge. Um, okay, let's uh, continue on. Uh, Smithsonian Environmental Research Center. Now, this is a long stretch of shoreline. It does look like a horse's uh, head in a sense. And uh, the big picture uh, uh, information that I found very valuable is actually a shoreline recession analysis. And in the Chesapeake Bay proper, we, there's a, the, well, luckily we have national archives in, uh, uh, nearby in Adelphi, Maryland. But the first really true survey was done in the 1840s where they had lectures, uh, 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 the coastal genetic charts where they literally mapped the actual shoreline. Then the 1890s, and then you have the aerial series that comes in the 1930s. And uh, Wes was talking a little bit about uh, uh, working with coastal processes as opposed to defending against. And typically, I hate this, no, not, uh, uh, to, uh, com not to complain or something, but uh, here in the United States, uh, we've been in mostly a defensive posture with a coastal protection. It's mostly a defensive posture where we build a wall, we make it tough, we um, <laughs> uh, keep, the, keep the shoreline from eroding. But then in the end, uh, Mother Nature typically wins. Uh, they tend to create a much turbulence there near shore and it tends to suspend the sediments and move it off, tends to under, undermine uh, structures, as opposed to having something that's open where the waves can actually be attenuated in the beach face. So with that, we have a bimodal condition. Uh, winter time, winds prevail from the Northwest where the cold Canadian winds come down, come down the uh, coast. And, uh, uh, and then the, the, the summer winds prevail from the South. And you can see this on the, 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 the uh, uh, the light blue for the winter waves and the, and the uh, slightly red uh, for the summer waves coming up from the south. And then, then we also have the, the tropical storm events, which come from like the nor'easters. So, so uh, and you see that from this one side. Now, this particular project, the nose of the horse is exposed to the longest fetch, which is up by the Chesapeake Bay Bridge. The other ones are relatively close. But after you get these pieces together, then you start thinking about what is the reality that's going on here. Now, the winter waves, you see they're going down to the south, but look at the erosion. If you look at the erosion of the horse's ear on the north side, the erosion is going the opposite way. And that doesn't make sense. That's not physical sense at all. So what, what is the reason behind this? And you think about this, and it's uh, in the Chesapeake Bay, uh, this is the, the 1899 coastal, uh, coastal uh, chart. And horses head the horse the Chesapeake um, the, the Cheston Point, which is Cirque, the, it's right down in this general area. Um, uh, between eighteen uh, forties, where it's all uh, sailing ships in the bay, to the eighteen nineties, where you had power ships, where you actually you didn't need wind to actually make things go, and a lot of our goods and services were done by water back in the day. So what really was really defining these, this particular shoreline is boat wake waves. They also do impart energy on the shoreline. They have the ability to move things around. So it's, a, it's something that we had to accommodate in our, in our design. So uh, with that, instead of doing, uh, uh, when you do headland breakwater design, you have to literally plot the embayments. Basically, we have two hard parts and you have an, an embayment piece, you plot them. 
So we have to use the boat wake waves going in and out of, of, of the, uh, in and out along the shoreline. And that's typical in the Anne Arundel County uh, areas of these river sections. Uh, you do have you know, wind influence, but uh, really boat wake waves really drive some of the parts. And if you look at you know, doing these over and over again, and if you look, compare the shorelines from the 1840s, you know, when they had the sailing ships to the 1890s, there was a lot of erosion going on in the 1800s because all the shorelines had evolved for thousands of years just in a wind-driven kind of environment. But you start bringing in the, the, the power boats, that really did change a lot of, of, the, of the bay shorelines. So, so, and once you get that, and also to, as we stated, share this information with your, with your reviewers. I mean, this is something that it's fact-based. It's the reason why you were doing the project. These are the reasons why. It really is a much easier and better way to roll. Okay, Northeast Isles. This is the title freshwater uh, project up in Northeast Maryland. And if you do, uh, doing the um, uh, shoreline recession part, similar to like I did surf, you just get a feel for what's going on. If you look carefully, um, in uh, uh, 1938, the blue line, to, to, to calibrate your eyeballs, I do this as a spectrum, you know, like, a, like a prism, a color thing. Blue is the oldest and red is the, red is the newest. 1938, the shoreline was here. 1952, it was way out here. And then 1957, started going back. Um, gee, I wonder why. Well, what happened between 1938 and 1952? They dredged Northeast River and did an open, open dredge material placement area here. They just dumped it in there and it, it was just a sediment rich environment. And look at these long, uh, long uh, peninsulas over on this side where uh, you have this long area that goes back in this part. What gives here? Um, well, if you go into the 1938 aerial photography, lo and behold, this was actually a uh, place where they had a sand and gravel pit, where they had trains literally bring the sand and gravel down here. And these are the actual barges for the sand and gravel. They used to you know, take them up and down the bay. And to protect this, they literally just dumped or, or placed, uh, maybe dumped in place, but that's the long of uh, these, all these areas. Again, what it does, it makes it a very sediment rich environment. So uh, sometimes you work with shorelines that are sediment starved. Uh, this one, sediment is your friend. So what you need to do is design a, a project where it actually uh, re-diverts the waves, brings in the sediment and actually builds up the, 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 um, the, the shoreline. And lo and behold, that's what, that's what, that's what did. Um, that's what that that's how it behaved. So um, the, uh, we planted it here. It was mostly for the for the plant folks, uh, marsh hibiscus. Uh, we also had sporganium. We had irises. So we uh, really uh, uh, jazzed it up a little bit in our planting planting palette. Okay, the uh, the last project is Blackwater National Wildlife Refuge, and I guess you can you know, consider this to be the poster child of uh, <laughs> marsh loss on the Eastern shore, land subsidence, nutrient uh, pressures. So in 1938, if you look in this side, the project itself is in this area. Um, there's a, a historical pond here and one over here, but all in all, it's an attack marsh. But you go to 2010, you can see everything's unraveling and you know, even adjacent, it's just, it's just going to pieces in a sense. So this particular project, um, the, we, the, it's so far away from where sediment sources are, we were uh, stumped about how to actually get the material to raise this marsh up. And uh, we uh, basically, uh, we did uh, shoreline of studies, uh, shoreline surveys, you know, doing the bathymetry about 8,000 feet upriver and downriver. And then the other part too, which uh, benefit on this project, was actually there's two studies. Uh, one was done by uh, 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 Matt Kerwin and uh, regarding like the optimal planting elevations for uh, different species, uh, mostly you know Sportata patens and also three square. Um, they, and then also there was a sediment uh, flux study done by uh, uh, Neil Ganju, which uh, essentially he converted it over and he, that was done down here at the bridge to see what type of sediment is actually net moving out of the Blackwater National Wildlife Refuge. And you convert it over, it equates to about 
three fully loaded tandem dump trucks on average uh, being exported down the Black Little River into uh, Fishing Bay. Uh, and then the winter time with the Northwest winds, they tend to be uh, uh, higher sediment uh, uh, going out because it's pushing through in that large place that are affectionately known as Lake Barbados, which is the central part of the wildlife refuge. Uh, and the summertime less so, but in, on average, about five dump trucks are, are leaving uh, uh, Blackwater. So again, you know, basically sharing this information with the reviewers up front before we start going into the actual um, the hard design and all the evaluations, it's very critical. It's, very, it's also important, you know, for uh, obviously for the political side too, you know, working with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to make sure that their needs and goals and missions are satisfied when you go through the entire process. So um, uh, in the end, what we found out was uh, we had on the inner meander bends, uh, it behaves, uh, there were accreting zones, outer meander bones, outer meander bends, it was an scour area. So uh, but using the Neil Ganju uh, uh, paper, uh, basically we, we uh, borrowed the inner meander bend, the accretion friendly zone in the actual uh, river reach and use that for the thin layering part to actually uh, go ahead and place it in there. And our target elevations were from the uh, uh, Matt Kerwin paper uh, so it was 30 centimeters NABD 88. Um, and then over time, we went back annually to me measure to make sure our predictions, the observed matches the prediction. And it did, did indeed, again, uh, the accreted in the accretion friendly area. So, um, and, you know, typically uh, on, on the regulatory side, dredging is mostly related to navigation projects. This is kind of new because we're using uh, dredging for restoration. And it's kind of like a, 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 a different kind of fit, but in the end, it all worked out. So, uh, and to, for the for actual, the end part, was this is sort of the post uh, the post elevation pieces. Um, so uh, you know, only about a, a minute left. Uh, so what I was going to do is just uh, uh, saying that in general, you know, I, I'm I'm encouraged about what's coming up uh, on the horizon. I really think, and I shared with a timeline for the regulatory side about where we've been and where we are right now. And just listen to everybody today. It's super encouraging to. Uh, uh, seeing that with climate resiliency, these projects, I, I think it's going to be a, um, a, a different regulatory uh, framework because the regulatory framework back in the day was related to development with actual permanent impacts, I mean, parking lots, things that permanently do, uh, take away from things. The projects we have now are more restoration based, not tied to the project. We just try to want to make things better in the end. So with that, I'm going to stop. And I will be able to turn it back over to Allison, I believe. Take care. Yes. Yep. Thank you, Albert. Sure. All right. All right, folks. Um, our next speaker is Cindy Plinkus um, from UMSIS. And um, we're going to reorder the um, agenda just a little bit. And that Cindy will be our last presenter before we take a break. Um, so, Albert, That's if you can stop sharing. I'm sharing, right? Yep. I guess so Cindy can go ahead and share. Um, and she's going to be talking to us a little bit about living shorelines and SAV. Um, and so she'll go and then we'll be taking a quick 10 minute break. Um, and please continue to put your questions and discussion in the chat. And we are making sure to capture all of that. And Cindy is loaded up. You're good to go. I'm not hearing you though, Cindy, if you are speaking. Right. One has to unmute. Um, <laughs> there you go. My God. Um, yeah. So what I was saying that you couldn't hear is that it was fun to go right after Albert, because one of the projects that I'm not talking about today is work that I'm doing with William Narden down at Assateague, the living shoreline that we heard about earlier today, and some others in that general region to see um, how we can take knowledge that we've learned from natural marsh systems and whether we can transfer that directly to the created marshes of living shorelines or whether we need to like tinker a little bit. Um, so stay tuned, that's a very new project. But what I'm talking about today is work that I've done with Lori Staver. Um, and we are interested in um, 
looking at living shoreline performance. So basically what happens after you put that living shoreline in that we've talked about so much. Um, and then also asking the question, does age matter? And so this is work that has been funded by the Chesapeake Bay Trust, the Grace B. Kerr Fund, Maryland DNR, and soon, actually just this month, uh, Maryland Sea Grant, we're starting a new project. Okay, so our main research questions that kind of span all of our projects is what we wanna know is, do living shorelines reduce shoreline erosion? So how well do they perform? Uh, do they impact submerged aquatic vegetation or SAV? either the benthic habitat and or their distributions in adjacent shallow waters, which I call subtitle. And then we also wanna know if they increase the net sediment nutrient burial in the coastal zone, which would get at the idea of co-benefits. And then we also wanna know, do the answers to those questions depend on the age of the living shoreline? So we have a few projects going that I'm gonna to talk to you about. The first one, we started with the Chesapeake Bay Trust. Uh, we started looking at living shorelines that were about 10 years old at the time that we sampled. And then we subsequently got funding from the Grace B. Kerr Fund to look at younger living shorelines. They were actually two years old when we started. Um, and what's unique about that study is that we've been going back to the same living shorelines for three years now. So we actually have a time series of observations, which is kind of fun. Um, and then we have started working with Maryland DNR about the resiliency through res restoration program that you heard about from Nicole. We've done some pre-construction monitoring and when some of those projects get constructed, we'll go back and look at the post-construction. Okay, so just sort of thinking chrono chronologically, um, we started with that older living shoreline study. So what we did was we wanted to find living shorelines that were about 10 years old. Um, we paired them with a nearby natural marsh, um, natural shoreline, not necessarily a marsh. Um, and we wanted them to all be kind of similar and where they were. So what you're looking at here, like this is the Chesapeake Bay, right? We're on the Eastern shore is the zoom out. All these dots are living shorelines that we sampled at. So a lot of them are in the St. Michael's region, give or take a couple, there's one up here. Um, and what we wanted to do is look at not only what's going on with the sediment and the vegetation in the living shoreline itself, but what happens to the SAV that may or may not be right in front of that site. So we chose four sites that had persistent dense SAV before the living shorelines went in and four that did not have a persistent SAV before installation and then just simply asked like what happened basically. And then to that body of, of uh, living shoreline sites. So the 10 year old sites that I just mentioned, they're in blue on this map. So you can find them here, 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 there. Um, and then we got funding from the Grace B. Kerr Fund to look at the younger shoreline. So what we did was we tried to pick ones that were relatively close to the older living shoreline. So that's the zoom out over here. You can see the lighter blue dot would be a younger living shoreline. So the idea is that we have old ones, which are the dark blue. We have nearby natural shorelines, which are the brown. And then we have younger ones, which are the lighter blue. Okay, so the first question is erosion rates before and after installation. Um, this is an image from Google Earth that I love because it shows one of our sites actually being constructed. And you can see that what happens is this would be the shoreline here and they actually build it out and then plant on top of that. So when we go in, what we're looking at is, what we're looking for is the shoreline position before and after installation. Um, and we do that from um, aerial photos from BIMS and also historical shoreline surveys by the Maryland Geological Survey. And I'm skipping a lot of the details, but we can talk about that more if you want. Um, the yellow dots are the living shoreline sites. You can see them pretty clearly in the photo. Um, and then the natural or reference shorelines are across the water there. So looking at what happens at our natural shoreline, so these are the do nothing case. Um, so change rate, if it's positive, uh, it's accretion. So you would see that as the shoreline moving, oh, mistake on the slide, sorry. Um, positive is accretion, so the shoreline moves out. So you would observe that as a property owner, as like, I gained property, basically. Um, negative is erosion. The shoreline moves landward, so backwards. Um, so we have here uh, the erosion rates at the historical sites in the lighter colors, and then the current rates in the darker colors. And what you see is at the shorelines where nothing happened, the erosion rates continue 
at or maybe even above the uh, historical rate. So you do nothing, nothing changes basically. You put in a living shoreline and now your historical rates, they're about the same at our living shoreline sites, no surprise. But now when you put in a living shoreline, you actually have accretion because you moved that shoreline out. Um, and it's an instantaneous change rather than a rate. So if I were a property owner, I would love that because I did not lose my shoreline. I in fact got some more. So the next question is, um, do living shorelines impact SAV um, habitat? So these are a lot of graphs. Um, so they're all set up the same. Um, on the left-hand side, you have what's happening at the living shorelines. The right-hand side is what's happening at the reference ones. We have a mud content. We have organic content over here on the right. And then we have the mass accumulation rate or accretion rate on the bottom. And then the colors are always lighter for before construction and the darker color is after construction. So what we do is we take very long sediment cores in the adjacent water. Um, and then using some of the tools that I have in my lab, we can, can like basically put together a history of the sediment that happened in that core. And we can look at what the sediment looks like before the living shoreline went in and also after the living shoreline went in. And we're now in the water. So in the subtitle where SAV could maybe be living, maybe not, um, but not in the living shoreline itself. So if you were been puzzling at this, this whole time that I was talking and being like, I don't see any difference, you're not supposed to because there is no significant difference. Um, when we look at them as an ensemble, there's a lot of variability among all of our sites and it just sort of is like variable, nothing really happened. So as an ensemble, nothing changes. But if we look at an individual site, we can see big changes. So this is one site, this is at Myrtle Grove, which is near Easton, if anyone is familiar with the area. And what you're looking at here is just the mud content. So how much mud do we have at that site before the um, living shoreline went in and then after the living shoreline went in. And so here we see, we do have a really big increase in the mud content at that site. And we also see an increase in the, um, in the accretion rate. Oh, no, I'm sorry, this is at the reference site, sorry. Um, so this is the living shoreline site on the left, the reference, so the do nothing case, we also see that increase. And so the reason why I'm showing you that reference shoreline is because I would really be hard pressed to tell you that that increase in the mud content is linked to the living shoreline going in because it happened also at the site where we did nothing. So that's telling me that something is happening in that body of water that's not necessarily related to the living shoreline going in. Um, it's certainly possible that there are downstream impacts um, and that's something that I'm looking at exploring in, pre in like future work. Um, but I really don't think that's the case. It really looks like it's the similar trend at both of those. I don't see any big difference. That's not always the case. Um, so this is a different site. Same idea, we're looking here at the mud content at the living shoreline site before the living shoreline goes in and after. And here we actually see a decrease in the mud content and we see the flip at the reference site. And so this tells me that what I thought on the previous slide where I was like, I don't know, it doesn't seem like it's really related to the living shoreline. I think each site is kind of like doing its own thing. That's what's happening at this site. So we have changes in the sediment, but the change that's happening at the living shoreline site is really different than what's happening at the reference site. And so that tells me that the sediment impacts are actually really site specific. So I think I would be hard pressed to really make any general statements about like, I put in a living shoreline, X is going to happen. Um, I think it really depends on your specific site, what the sediment is like, what the um, energy is like, what the plant community is like, all that good stuff. So if the sediment impacts really depend on exactly where you are, what happens to SAV? Um, so this is um, SAV area within the quad. So when I say quad, I mean the aerial surveys that the Virginia Institute of Marine Science, they do every year, most years over most of the bay. Um, and the quad is like the region. Um, so it'd be like a body of water, a small body of water. Um, so all of our sites in St. Michael's, for example, all are within the same quad. So um, what I did here was I just looked, the green dots are what's happening in the quad in hectares. I started 
the time series in 2017, which is when we took our samples at those older living shorelines. And then I simply went back in time 10 years. So the start and stop are kind of arbitrary, cho chosen by me kind of thing. But what I wanted to show you is that, as we know, SAV comes and goes for reasons that have nothing to do with living shorelines, that mostly due to water quality, also sediment quality, um, energy, all that good stuff. And so we have like years that are great, years that are not so great, um, nothing to do with living shorelines yet. So the next thing to look at is what is happening at the site. So the brown circles are right in front of our site. These are data that come from the um, survey. So I just looked right like the closest spot, closest to the, um, the living shoreline and they are given a density class of zero to four. So that's just like a class. It's not, not really like a measurement per se, just like how much do we have four being great, zero being nothing's there. Um, and so again, if you're puzzling to yourself, being like those lines look kind of the same, it's because they do, I think. Um, there's a little bit of an interesting, maybe an offset here, maybe some differences like this year, but generally we're following the trend in the region. And if I didn't know when the living shoreline went in, it would be tough for me to say that the relationship changes. So I'll spoil that the living shoreline goes in where that red line is. And the um, what's happening at the site relative to what's happening in the quad is really the same before and after. And then if we go ahead and layer on the reference site, we're plotting nearly on top of what's happening at our site. So no difference between SAV at the site and the reference site, and both are really following what's happening at the quad. Now you might be saying to yourself, well, some sites the SAV just like completely disappears. And that's what happens at this one. This is nearby. So we're in the same quad, but a different site. So the green line is the same. We have a great, great SAV, not so great SAV, and then it comes back um, at the site. So right close to our living shoreline, we're following the trend and then the SAV crashes and it never comes back after it crashes. Um, that also, um, so the living shoreline went in here. So I think it would be tough to argue that this crash had anything to do with that living shoreline going in because it happens many, many years before that living shoreline goes in. And it happens at the reference site. The reference site also has that crash. Um, sorry, so what we find is that SAV is generally following what's happening in the quad or over the region, except for some sites where something more local is going on. So the one that we're looking at right now um, both the living shoreline site and the reference site, the SAV completely disappears. And so something is happening in that small region, but it's not as localized as we found with the sediment. So living shoreline installation really doesn't appear to influence SAV distribution um, at all. Um, we are exploring that at more. So right now we have um, eight, eight sites where we have that 10 years post installation window. Um, we have we're up to five years now at our younger living shorelines, and we're about to start a new project with Sea Grant that will give us another um, six to eight older living shorelines. So we can add some more sites to this to give it some more robustness. Um, but I really don't see any evidence for living shorelines influencing SAV. Um, so then just thinking about co-benefits, um, what is, what's really controlling what's happening in the marsh is of course plants, plants are there. Um, and it's not just in the marsh, it's also in the subtitle or in the adjacent water where we have um, SAV growing. So what you're looking at here, these are uh, accretion rates. On the left-hand side, you're looking in the water. Um, and I separated the sites into whether they had SAV present or SAV absent. And no surprise where we have SAV, we have higher accretion rates. We know that's because the plants are trapping the sediment. And the same thing is happening in the marsh. Here we're looking at accretion rate on the y-axis, stem density on the x-axis, and we have a really robust linear regression line between the two. So more plants, more sediment trapping, which also means that any nutrients that are attached to that sediment is also getting trapped. So when you put in a living shoreline, you're getting that additional benefit of the sediment trapping that happens within the marsh itself that you wouldn't have if you did not install a living shoreline. 
Okay. And then what is the whole age thing? What does that have to do with anything? Um, so, so we figured out a whole bunch of stuff for our older living shorelines. And then just quickly looking at what we find in our younger ones. So here we're looking on the left at mud content and on the right is the accretion rate. Um, and we have um, at our younger living shorelines, we have data from 2019 and 2020. Um, I, we have data from 2021, but I don't have it yet included in this plot. So these are the exact same sites in 2019 and 2020. And then only in the nearby 10 year old box, I'm only including sites that are close to those young living shorelines. So it's as apples to apples as we can get. The letters are just statistics. Um, saying, is it statistically different or not? Um, but even without the statistics, I think it's pretty easy to see that the younger living shorelines have lower mud content than the older living shorelines. Um, and one could perhaps argue an increase between 2019 and 2020. Um, but when we get that 2021 data, I think it'll make it a little bit more clear, like maybe it's nothing or maybe it's an increase. I don't know yet. Um, so accretion rates, the younger living shorelines have a much lower accretion rate than the older ones. Um, and we only have data at the moment for 2020. So what about stem density? Um, stem density, this is the same setup here. So we're just looking now at stem density, 2019, 2020, and then those 10 year old sites, really no difference because we have a really big spread. We're going from like in 2019, almost nothing up to quite a lot. Um, and so this is, again, a situation where the ensemble average is obscuring any specific trend that we might find. Um, but when we match up um, each site's mud content with its stem density, um, I had to include everything here to get enough data points to even try to run a linear regression. Um, but they are colored by age. And what we find is we have a nice linear regression between the mud content and the stem density. So again, more plants higher mud content. Maybe a different relationship for the older ones than the younger ones, maybe. Um, and then accretion rates, if we close our eyes for a second and ignore that point, um, we have a really nice linear regression. So more stems, higher accretion rates, um, except the oddball. Um, and we need to figure out what's going on with that one. Um, and also, again, when we get more data, we should have a few more data points in there to help us out. Um, so not sure, question mark. Probably, but maybe not. Cindy, you got about three minutes. Cool, I'm just about done. Um, awesome. So summary, performance shoreline erosion rates. We have net accretion at living shorelines because they build that shoreline out. Um, if we do nothing, we get nothing. We get continuing erosion at or above historical rates. Um, impacts of living shorelines to the adjacent benthic habitat, site-specific impacts to the sediment, Nothing that I see really impacting SAV distributions, which appear to follow trends at larger spatial scales. And co-benefits, SAV and marsh plants are really good at trapping sediments. Um, and so anything that's attached to that is also gonna get trapped. Um, and when we have more vegetation, we get higher accretion rates. And when we have older living shorelines, we get more accretion. And then does age matter for sediment trapping? Sure seems like it. Uh, higher mud and accretion rates at older living shorelines. Vegetation, maybe, um, lots of variability in the data. Um, and then I wanted to just quickly skip to that we are working with Nicole um, with resiliency through restoration. So we are at three of their sites for now at Oxford, Hearst Creek, and then Selsey Road, um, which is by Ocean City. Um, so we've done pre-construction monitoring and we're hoping that they'll go in this year. We can do post-construction and we're doing our bag of tricks. Um, sediment characteristics, deposition rates, vegetation species, stem height and density, and elevation and water depth. And I think, oh, sorry, last slide, just to show you what it looks like. So this is at Selsey Road, because each of them, what I wanted to point out is that each of them has paired with it a adjacent reference site. So for Selsey Road, there's the natural marsh over here that's not gonna get impacted at all. And then we have where the installation is gonna go in over here. So we would expect to find lots and lots of changes here, hopefully not too many changes over here. And that's it. So thank you. Thanks so much, Cindy. Okay, folks, um, thanks for sticking with us. That was a lot of great information. Um, we're gonna go ahead and take a 10 minute break now. So we'll reconvene um, just before 2.50.
um, so 247. Um, so go ahead, um, grab your camera, camera, take a stretch break, get some water, um, and we'll see you back here in about 10 minutes. All right, so it is 2.48. Hopefully folks were able to stretch their legs a little bit. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. We're welcoming back. Um, let me pull up the agenda. So we're gonna hear from Kevin Smith next with the Maryland Coastal Base Program. Um, and same as before, questions or discussion in the chat. And Kevin, if you are ready, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Allison. Well, let's see if I get my... You are good to go. All right. Thank you, Allison. Um, uh, the first thing I'll say, Allison, is I think you deserve everybody or deserve, uh, everyone deserves an apology from you. Um, I just stepped outside during the break and it's absolutely gorgeous. And I think you should really schedule these things for really crappy days, so. Uh, I will, I, I agree. And I, I apologize to everyone. I too stepped okay. outside and thought to myself, hmm, it's, it's quite beautiful. nice out here. Well, um, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, hello to those of you that um, I only see on Zoom these days, um, and, uh, and hello to the folks that I haven't met before, and thanks for inviting me. I'm glad to be here doing this. Um, my name's Kevin Smith. I'm the director at the Maryland Coastal Bays Program, and I'm going to be talking about working with communities to balance habitat and infrastructure needs. Um, I'm going to ramble a little bit here and there during the presentation, but I'll try to stay somewhat on track as much as I can. And um, first thing I want to do is just kind of let you know who I am and, and the organization that I work for, which is the Maryland Coastal Bays Program, and just a little bit of history about our program established in 1996, so uh, we're entering our 26th year. Uh, the watershed that, uh, that, that we work in is entirely within one county within Maryland. And so that makes it kind of nice. Um, it's not uh, an amalgamation of counties and towns and, and states like the Chesapeake Bay program is. So it makes it somewhat manageable. Um, got quite a bit of, of, uh, of water in our, in our watershed here, um, open water. And, uh, and a lot of wetlands and a lot of shoreline. So, um, so our mission really is to protect those waters and wildlife that make up this coastal ecosystem. So uh, our organization, the Coastal Bay Program is really guided by uh, a, a document that's put together. It's a 10 year document and it's called the Comprehensive Conservation and Management Plan, or CCMP. And this particular plan is, uh, is, is developed uh, to cover a 10-year period, and the one that we're in right now goes from 2015 to 2025. And we're actually in the beginning stages of getting ready to do our update, which will go from uh, 2026 to uh, 20, believe it or not, uh, 35. So it's almost really weird to say that number, but yeah. So um, anyway, um, we have 10 separate focus areas within this document. And the reason I really bring it up is because I did want to mention that in 2015, we added a coastal resilience focus area um, as part of this document. And, uh, and since that time, we've done some planning um, exercises which have uh, uh, basically provided us with an assessment of how climate issues are going to affect our CCMP and, uh, and how our, our goals are going to be affected by, uh, you know, these, these changes that we're all seeing, sea level rise, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I'll go ahead and get started with my talk. And, and I really wanted to talk about intersecting concerns here. Um, when I first talked to Allison and the others about doing this particular presentation, um, 
it was really kind of fortuitous in the sense that so many of these issues are really coming to the forefront right now. And, uh, and, and, and the fact that there is that they're not really separate uh, and distinct uh, issues. They are integrated issues. They all overlap with each other. Habitat needs and marsh loss and community resilience and dredging are all um, issues and concerns that, um, that, that overlap. So it's very difficult and not really smart to, uh, to deal with these issues in this kind of separate and distinct way but to look at it in an integrated fashion. And of course, um, with that, because this is a blue carbon uh, web series, uh, blue carbon plays a part in all of this as well. And uh, I know Carolyn is gonna be talking about that uh, in, the, in the next talk. So you'll hear more about that, but it uh, obviously is a factor and, and, and plays a role in all of this. So I don't want to really bum everybody out, but I'm probably going to bum you out just a little bit because I need to talk about some of the issues that we are facing here in the coastal bays, particularly with things like habitat loss. And, um, and, and one of the um, resulting uh, issues here is, um, is, is some of our colonial bird nesting species, things like black skimmers and royal terns. Um, we're losing them and we're losing them at a rapid rate. And in the last 20 years or so, we've lost about 90% of our population here in the coastal bays. That's pretty significant and pretty um, uh, jarring, quite honestly. And, uh, and the reason that we're losing them is because we're losing the nesting habitat that these birds need in order to um, sustain. And that nesting hat's habitat specifically are bare beaches, gravel, sandy beaches, pebbly beaches, shelly beaches. That's where these birds need to nest. Those are the habitats that are uh, going away. Um, and so, you know, we have a pretty concerted effort to try to restore some of these, uh, these types of habitats as well. And of course that overlaps with all of the other concerns that I just showed you uh, in the previous slide. Um, just as an example, Skimmer Island, which is an island just north of the Route 50 bridge, which goes into Ocean City, um, is a, um, was an area that was probably the, um, the, the, our biggest birding, bird nesting area for colonial nesting birds and waders and things like that about 1400 pairs of birds nesting on that island uh, about, uh, about 20 years ago. Today, there are no birds nesting on that island. Uh, the island is pretty much gone. Um, it's more of a shoal than it is an island now. And, um, and so not a good thing if you're a bird looking for a place to nest. Um, in 2019, the uh, Audubon uh, folks in conjunction with uh, ourselves and folks from the Department of Natural Resources did a study on the uh, on the colonial water bird and the islands that are um, here in the coastal bays and uh, and and really did an excellent job of of really putting together a, a report that um, very specifically um, put points out and shows how these losses are affecting the islands and the bird populations. And this is just a page from that report. In the lower right, what you see is Skimmer Island, which is just above that Route 50 bridge there. Um, you can kind of see it there and you can kind of see a little patch of grass that's on that island. Uh, I'll put my cursor on it right there. Uh, that no longer exists. The island is still there, but it's like I say, it's really more of a shoal today than it is. You'll see it at low tide, it's exposed at any kind of decent high tide. It, pretty much is not exposed at all anymore. On the left, you'll see the page, which shows a map of the coastal bays, along with um, some of the islands that are particularly important for, for bird nesting. And those icons that you see, like the wave, and then you see the, uh, the wave runner and the bird, basically, um, these are the impacts or the threats that are um, 
uh, that these islands are having. And you'll see a lot of them have this wave. And if it's red, it means uh, it's eroding pretty quickly. If you see the wave runner, that means that there's uh, uh, people that are accessing these islands when they shouldn't be, they're actually posted. Um, but, you know, they go up on these islands to, um, uh, you know, just spend the day there or whatever. And, um, and so those birds are not very, uh, not very good with uh, interactions with, with people. So um, a lot of different factors involved, but the loss of the habitat is the biggest one as far as their decline is concerned. Uh, this bird right here is the, uh, is the saltmouth sparrow. Uh, it's another bird species that is declining rapidly uh, in the mid-Atlantic and the uh, Northeast and probably is gonna end up on the endangered species list here, I would imagine, pretty soon. Um, but the reason for their decline, not the only one, but probably the biggest one, is the loss of their habitat, which is the salt marsh high hay or the high marsh area of these coastal areas, coastal marshes. And if you look at the map at the top there, you'll see where some of the priority salt marsh sparrow marshes are in Maryland, and you'll see there's a few over on the bay, but there's quite a bit here in the coastal bays. And, um, and, 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 and this coastal bays are really a stronghold for salt marsh sparrow habitat. Uh, and so that marsh and that particular high marsh area with the patents is so important, but it's, uh, we're losing it pretty quickly. And I'm gonna show you on this next slide uh, what is going on with these marshes. Um, if you look at the photos there, the one on the top left, it's a place called Cropper's Island, which is uh, about mid coastal Bay area here. And, um, and Cropper's Island, you can see it's a field, it's upland, but just to the west of Cropper's Island to the left uh, is marsh. And you'll see the one photo that is from, I want to say it's, Actually, I can't see it on my screen, but it is, um, I think, 2005. And then the one on the bottom is 2018. And what you'll notice in that photo is, um, is, is where water is replacing vegetated marsh. And a lot of that is really due to the mosquito ditching that occurred that was ubiquitous through these marshes uh, over the years and has uh, created some serious uh, inundation problems with water. Basically can't get out of the marsh, the grasses can't survive, the marshes start to degrade, they subside, and uh, it's this cycle of degradation that's really difficult to, um, you know, to, uh, to reverse. And actually Albert showed this really well in his photo, aerial photos from uh, Blackwater Wildlife Refuge, same type of thing happening there. Not necessarily related to mosquito ditching, but it's happening in other places too. So we've done some assessment work here, um, looking at some of this marsh loss. And while I'm really a little bit hesitant to give these numbers out because we're just not finished with that assessment yet, but you know we're looking at somewhere in the 20%, maybe 25% range of interior marsh loss occurring you know throughout the coastal bays so it's pretty it's pretty serious issue and and one that's um uh seems to have really increased within the last 15 years or so um so and and we're talking to a lot of folks who own marshland who are seeing the same thing happen so very serious problem and one that we're trying to address but uh, honestly a very difficult uh, difficult one to address as well. So big issue here in the coastal bays and one that's fairly recent. And then of course there's shoreline erosion. What I was showing you just earlier a minute ago was, was really interior marsh loss, uh, what's happening inside of these coastal marshes. And of course, you know, you've got what's going on on the edges of these coastal marshes, which is erosion, which isn't necessarily a not a natural, it is a natural process. However, it's probably being um, exacerbated to a large degree 
by boat wakes and, uh, and other factors, maybe loss of SAV and things like that, um, where it's, you know, it's been worse over time. And this is a photo, aerial photo of a place called uh, Jenkins Point, which is just below the Route 90 bridge that goes over the St. Martin River. And um, you may have seen this as you're traveling to Ocean City. Just look to your right, you'll see where um, basically what was once a peninsula is now really broken up into a series of islands. And this is actually a, um, a resiliency project that we're uh, looking to hopefully get some funding for so that we can provide some protection and resilience for the community that lies landward, Ocean Pines community. So you look at the, the, uh, the peninsula that, that was there at Jenkins Point and the kind of protection it provided until pretty recently, and you look at all the infrastructure that's landward of that, uh, you know, it's millions of dollars of, uh, you know, marinas and and houses, residential and, and other commercial interests. So, you know, it's a lot of, um, it's a lot of economy that's, uh, you know, that's, that's becoming more and more vulnerable over time. Another one that actually, uh, I think Cindy mentioned this one, the Celsi Road project. This is a uh, project that the county is spearheading here in Worcester. And, um, and it's a resiliency project that is hopefully gonna be happening in the not too distant future. I'll talk a little bit more about it um, just a little bit later, but I just wanted to show you the shoreline uh, erosion that's occurred there. And you look at the 1942 shoreline uh, map there and you can see how much has been lost over time. And you can imagine that the community that's just you know, south of all of this you know, how they can be impacted by this. And, um, and so um, some pretty serious uh, things lie ahead if, uh, if we don't address some of these issues. Just another map of that same area of Celsi Road. This is a 1972 wetland map and just shows the extent of the marsh, at least at that particular point in time. And you can even see that um, if the really white area where I'm kind of where my cursor is right now was actually upland area. It wasn't even determined to be wetland at that time. But all of this wetland in here, you actually see the number 72, it's all Spartina marsh that, and I'll just flip back to the previous slide so you can kind of see, it's pretty much gone and, um, and obviously provided a lot of protection for the folks who live in the community of Cape Isle of Wight. Okay. Um, and I, and I want to mention dredging and I'm, I'm really glad that Albert brought this up as well, because it's something that, um, that we've been wrestling with a bit. I'll talk about that. And that is really dredging, not for navigation, but dredging for restoration. And, um, and so, you know, there's a lot of dredging that occurs in the inlet area of, uh, of Ocean City. You can see where it opens up into the ocean there to the Atlantic. And a lot of that material that's dredged out of the inlet because it's continually getting filled in. And if you look out just out into the near shore area uh, on, in the Atlantic coast there, you can see where it, the, the sand wants to shoal up. And obviously there is a huge economy of recreational and commercial uh, boats that, that, that utilize this inlet. So it's really important from an economic standpoint and from a recreation standpoint. Um, so they're continually dredging this inlet uh, to get folks out into, the, uh, out into the ocean and back into the Bay Area. Most of that material is utilized for replenishment of acetate. So see where my cursor is, this is all Assateague National Park. And, um, and so most of this material is, is dredged from this inlet and then is placed uh, a little bit offshore here with hopper dredges uh, here so that it can um, feed the shoreline here at the National Park, uh, not the National Seashore. And that's a really important um, thing that's happening. Um, but one of the things that we would advocate for is to potentially use some of that material 
to restore some of the um, some of the bird nesting islands, uh, which which occurred in the coastal bay area. And again, you can see Skimmer Island right here. And at that time, when this picture was taken, it was more of an island. Uh, as as I was talking earlier, it's more of a shoal today. But this is a really great picture because one of the things it shows here too is some of the marsh loss that's occurred. And if you look and see where my cursor is in the lower left-hand corner of this picture, this is an area called um, uh, West Ocean City Marsh. And, um, and all this area right here, which is now open water, was once vegetated wetland. And the folks who live in this community here are very concerned as to what is going on with this marsh here, because obviously the marsh provides a lot of protection and resilience. Um, and if it's going away, and it is going away, um, what effect is that gonna have on the community itself? And um, so we actually have a meeting next week with the community and other folks to really address that issue. Um, so anyway. Okay, moving on, I'm going to go back to, uh, to Celsi Road and just talk about some of these projects that are uh, proposed. Celsi you gotta, Kevin, you've got about four minutes, four and a half minutes. Okay, Celsi Road is a, is a re, uh, restoration for resilience project, and you can see the design that's been, um, that's been uh, 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 developed here in the lower portion, which is going to go out there, and this is a project that um, uh, Scott Hardaway uh, uh, designed and hopefully is going to be going in the ground here in fairly short order. And Cindy is doing some work out there as are we to monitor some of the um, uh, some of the pre restoration metrics uh, out at the site. So it's going to be really interesting to see what happens in a couple of years after this after this goes in. Um, this is Tizard Island and. Um, Community engagement, I, I really wanted to talk about that here. Um, community engagement at the Celsi Road site, and I'll just go back real quick, um, was, was really quite uh, uh, somewhat difficult, I'll say, because you had to really manage expectations as to what the folks in the community could expect out of a project like this, particularly um, you know, they have flooding issues there. And, and a lot of folks thought, well, this project is going to help with our flooding. Well, you know what? It's probably not going to help with your flooding. Flooding is going to happen. What it will help with is these storm surges and wave energies that occur, uh, particularly during, you know, uh, high tide events and whatnot, from coming up on your, on your road and into your houses and driveways and all that kind of stuff. Um, but the flooding issue is probably not really going to be addressed um, that much. And so making sure the community understands that is, uh, is really important. And, you know, dealing with the different landowners and all the different property owners here can make for something that can be difficult to manage, quite honestly. Desert Island is a place uh, down in the lower portion of coastal bays down in Chincoteague Bay where we're undergoing a project. And if you look to the right, you'll see uh, a concept for, um, for work to take place out there, which is basically the establishment of these vegetated headland areas to help stem the erosion that's occurring there. Actually, Albert uh, was very involved in the uh, design of this particular project. Um, much easier dealing with the community because the community pretty much um, uh, consisted of one landowner. Um, so in this particular case, we're really able to focus on a lot of the habitat issues and, and restoring some of those habitats um, that are so important on this particular island because it really is a gem, um, particularly for, um, for uh, waterfowl, water birds, and, and things like that. And then, of course, there are those uh, engagement, community engagement um, uh, instances that are not really all that fun at all. And this was the case at Bishopville. Bishopville is a um, is a dam, or excuse me, there was a pond in Bishopville, which you can see in the picture here, um, which there was a, a low head, kind of four foot high sheet pile dam at the bottom, and um, and we were really interested 
and a couple of things there, but mostly it was fish passage. This is all tidal as you get up to the, to the dam and then non-tidal from there on out. But we wanted to be able to get fish up into the creek. Well, the community was concerned about a couple of things. One of them was maintaining the pond itself over time. And, um, and so this was a long engagement with the community, trying to, uh, trying to make sure that we understood what their concerns were and, and, and they were, and we're trying to get across what our uh, goals were for this project. And it was not always fun. And, um, and we had, we really had to work hard to get the community uh, on board with this and, uh, and supportive. But in Kevin, the end- I, Oops, sorry. I hate to cut you off, but we are at time. Do you have maybe okay. a final thought to share before we transition? I am going to finish this off in about 30 seconds. Perfect. So, um, so this particular project, uh, we did get everybody get, get everybody on board. We took out the dam and, and restored the fish passage in there. And the one thing I want to share with you here is that, you know, working with communities is, um, can be um, difficult um, and it can take a while, um, but it takes time. And when you put the time and energy in, it really does make a difference. And I have a little picture here at the bottom which uh, after we were finished this project, um, there was a local guy who does paintings and he presented me and some other folks with some paintings he did of Bishopville and the project itself, which I still have with me. I don't know if it shows up on the screen or not, but anyway, um, so I still keep this picture with me because it really is a, it was one of the, um, it was really gratifying to get that kind of um, gift from somebody in the community who, appreciated what we did. So with that, I am going to turn it back over to you, Allison. Thanks so much, Kevin. Sorry mm -hmm. to have had to cut you off there. No um, worries. Okay. Um, thank you, Kevin. Our next speaker yeah. is, uh, where are we? Carolyn. Karen, sorry. <laughs> Adjusted the agenda a little bit. So Carolyn, whenever you're ready to share your screen, go ahead and, and do that. We're seeing a journal article currently. <laughs> oh, wrong screen. Thought I had this all for, worked out. Settings. Is that better? No, we are not seeing anything now. <sighs> and all that practice we did. <laughs> I apologize. Few, I've got too many screens, I believe is my problem. Okay, let's try that. There we go. We're seeing your slides, not in presentation yep. mode yet, but we're seeing we're them. Get there in just a second. Perfect. Okay. You are good. Sorry about that. Um, I'm Carolyn Curran, uh, hopefully better at uh, some things than uh, getting slides on to my computer and out to you. Um, I'm going to be talking to you today about blue carbon and living shorelines. And this photo is the NOAA lab in Beaufort, North Carolina. I was a scientist for NOAA um, until this summer. I retired, worked a lot during that time on living shorelines, uh, marsh responses, sea level rise, and blue carbon. My colleague, Jenny Davis, who I did a lot of this work with, was unavailable today. So I um, was happy to step up and do this, and I've really enjoyed the presentations today. So um, this, is, this has been um, a, a benefit uh, to me as well. Now I'm going to talk about uh, several research projects uh, we did uh, over the last 15, 20 years um, on the on particularly blue carbon and living shorelines. And I just want to uh, step back for a second and kind of very brief refresher about what coastal blue carbon, in particular blue carbon in marshes, is all about. Um, coastal blue carbon is really the habitats of mangroves, uh, salt marshes, and seagrasses which share a number of features which make them very effective at storing carbon. They all have high rates of primary production. Um, a lot of that production is in below ground biomass or detritus that gets buried into an anaerobic saline sediment. And that's really important because that means that the decomposition of that organic material is slowed and the end products of microbial decomposition are not methane. 
Um, the other really important feature, particularly for salt marshes and mangroves, is that uh, they keep up with sea level rise by accreting sediment. So not only do they increase the carbon in the sediment, they actually increase the soil volume. Uh, it's also important just to remind ourselves that it's a fairly small percentage of the annual production that is preserved for that 100 year blue carbon market. Um, so I believe you all had some talks earlier today about carbon accounting. And so we're not interested in what we're interested in. It's very important for many reasons that above ground biomass and all that primary production. But for the carbon market, it's really that carbon that's buried uh, in those uh, sediments, um, mangroves can have some woody biomass that persists that long as well. And the other thing I want to point out is that most of the carbon then exits that habitat um, over fairly short time frames. It may get eaten and moved out by organisms. It may become dissolved or become a particulate detritus. And one of the really tough things about carbon accounting and, and thinking about living shorelines in any kind of marsh and blue carbon is that Carbon moves in and out of these systems, and that can make it a, a, a little bit of a challenge to uh, to track what is actually going to be uh, going to be considered blue carbon. Um, I put this graph up here. I think it's um, a picture put together by the San Francisco Bay uh, Group. I think it really illustrates nicely uh, the situation, particularly for a living shoreline that you've planted. And this idea that you're not only you see there on the left, there you've got plants going into a sandy substrate with a shallow root zone. Um, after a few years, in response to silver rise, the marsh has trapped sediment, so actually increased the elevation or the volume of that sediment in addition to uh, more root production, some of which sticks around, some of which doesn't. And over a long time, if, over a long time, you can get a um, substantial increase in that soil volume. And you can also get, um, you can also see that uh, accumulation of uh, below ground biomass over time. So this, this results in uh, these blue carbon habitats having really high uh, carbon burial rates per unit area. So this is a graph that you've probably seen a lot, which compares a number of different kinds of forests with these coastal blue carbon habitats. That scale on the left is a, a exponential scale. So you see that, um, Salt marshes, mangroves, and seagrasses can be you know, up to two to 10 times higher per unit area in terms of their carbon burial rate. However, um, kind of the caveat here is that blue carbon habitats occupy a comparatively much smaller area than terrestrial habitats. I've heard them described as the dental floss around a continent. It's just not much area. And that means that that limited extent um, really reduces their overall contribution of, of this blue carbon. And this is, shows you, you can hardly even see the tidal wetland bar uh, compared to the terrestrial bar. And the other thing I think we all need to keep in mind, and I've heard a couple of people talk about it today, is it's really, you know, we have to think about the anthropogenic CO2 inputs associated with the restoration as well. And that's, that's really, um, you know, just overwhelms what we can do with uh, tidal wetland restoration. But it's important. It's, it's an important part of, uh, of the solution. So I want to talk a little bit now about um, marsh response to sea level rise, um, shoreline erosion, and how they bear on th this question of marsh blue carbon. On the left is a photograph of a marsh uh, core that we collected uh, from North Carolina. It's about two meters long, six feet long. Um, the bottom of that core uh, made contact with that paleo shoreline. Uh, the sand shoreline, and we radiocarbon uh, dated the uh, carbon at the bottom of that core, and it was 2,400 years old. And so this, you know, kind of demonstrates that marsh sediment can contain carbon that's 100 to even thousands of years old. As you as you got to the top of that core, um, we're coming up through time, of course, and one of the things we were able to do, and this was work uh, published by um, uh, Nathan McTighe, who was a postdoc in my lab at the time, is he was able to, we have a really good record of sea level rise in the North Carolina coast for this time period. So at the beginning of this marsh, when this material was first laid down, sea level rise was somewhere between zero and one millimeters per year. And over the next 1,500 years, it gradually increased, but it really started getting fast um, around 200 years ago where we started getting 
uh, something like the two to three millimeters per year. And if we calculated the carbon accretion rate during that time period, that carbon accretion rate increased along with the rate of sea level because of sea level rise, because as we mentioned before, they're building volume, those feedback mechanisms for the marsh to stay uh, in the same place in the tidal frame. There've been some papers published um, recently which point to um, carbon accumulation is going to increase. And so although we're losing some wetlands, they're also accumulating carbon faster. And that is going to be true for a point. And you know, maybe another 30, 40 years into the future, uh, that'll be the case. But at some point uh, when sea level rise gets to around somewhere 10 to 12 millimeters per year, um, there's just not enough suspended sediment in the system. Uh, there's not enough tide. And at some point, um, uh, the, the concern is that marshes are not going to be able to keep up with, uh, with sea level rise in their current location. They can migrate landward, but they may not be able to persist in their current location. Um, on the right side of this, this graph, um, we see uh, another problem, and that's shoreline erosion. This is taken um, from the Atlantic Intercoastal Waterway in North Carolina. You can see you know, this really beautiful, deep, organic, rich marsh carbon exposed along the shoreline. And Pendleton and all in 2012 published a paper that really kind of talked about um, coastal wetland loss, whether by drowning or by erosion, and um, pointed out the problem globally and made an estimate of 120 teragrams carbon per year, which is a lot. Um, but they also really identified some of the uncertainties we have about how much is going, how much wetland is going to be lost, and really what happens to that carbon when it's uncovered. Does it immediately decompose and return as CO2? Does it get redistributed back up on the marsh and reburied? Some of it goes out into the ocean. Um, so there's a lot of uncertainties. And uh, another one of the things that um, uh, Nathan and I um, worked, looked at was, was at the decomposition of this eroded carbon. And we published a paper that kind of said, yeah, you know, it's not perhaps as bad. Um, as it could be, because as it turns out that that old carbon is really recalcitrant and it doesn't decompose really, really fast. And we found that at the temperatures we find around the U.S. coast, you know, maybe six to 25 percent of it would decompose in a year if maintained in an aerobic environment. And we came up with a somewhat smaller guess as to what this might be. But again, um, we made some conservative guesses on erosion rates. Anyway, so here we go. We've got on one hand, marshes are really good at creating sediment with sea level rise, but we've got some real concerns with marsh erosion. And that's really uh, where we get this connection between living shorelines and blue carbon. Living shorelines are built to help um, limit shoreline erosion and provide these wetland habitats we would otherwise lose through sea level rise and through, um, through erosion. This picture is from um, Piver's Island, one of the one of the living shorelines um, on Piver's Island uh, that we that we studied. Here's a, going back to this picture. I'm going to um, first give you um, a review of paper that we published in 2015, looking at blue carbon in living shorelines. So here in Beaufort, we we're lucky to have um, a number of living shorelines and a couple of also. Um, transplanted marshes that were um, constructed on dredge spoil. Kevin was talking about dredge spoil islands. There's a couple of old ones nearby. So these arrows all indicate locations of either living shorelines that were um, between uh, 12 and 40 years old. And then, and they weren't even, they even kind of predated the term living shorelines, but that's what they were. And then a couple of the transplanted uh, dredge spoil marshes. And then we also had a couple of natural marshes in the area. At each one of these sites, we collected sediment cores. Uh, they're about 35 centimeters deep. We sectioned them into five centimeter intervals and measured um, percent organic matter, bulk density, and then um, uh, organic carbon and nitrogen content of the sediment. So here's some data. It's got bulk density on the left and percent organic matter on the right. And the hatched um, symbols are the natural marshes and the solid colors are the living shoreline and transplanted marshes. You can see that in terms of both bulk density, we got higher bulk density in the, um, in the, in the uh, sandy marshes and the transplanted marshes. 
um, and we've got um, lower bulk density, of course, in the in the uh, natural marshes. And over on the right side, you see that those natural marshes have pretty significant amount of organic matter all the way down to the bottom of the core. And you can see that all the transplanted marshes, um, we really don't see much organic matter, much, you know, just that top 15 centimeters, which is that rooting zone. But you can also see um, that our oldest uh, transplanted marshes, which are the green and the purple dots, they are getting closer uh, to the natural marshes. And, and we know from work done years ago by Chris Kraft and others that, you know, really soil development, sediment development of all the things when you're looking at transplanted restored marshes, you know, the fish come in really quick, the plants grow, the birds come in, but really the last thing that really develops um, uh, equivalency to natural marshes is, is, is the sediment. And that's what we're seeing here. Here is the organic carbon stock in these marshes. So here on the top, this is organic carbon kilograms per meter squared. And you can see uh, this is the age of the marshes. Um, and you can see all the marshes, again, that organic matter is pretty much confined to the top 15 or 20 centimeters, pretty similar. And then there's much, much more organic carbon in the natural marshes. If you take on the bottom graph there, if you take that organic carbon in those sediment cores and, and divide that by the age of the marsh, you can, you can see a real decline. So the very early, the very youngest marshes seem to have this, oh my gosh, 250 grams of carbon per meter squared per year. That's great. And then as the marshes get older and all the way to the oldest marshes, we're getting down to 100 grams of carbon per meter squared per year. And that's because we have to be careful when we're looking at these blue carbon in these young marshes is a lot of the carbon that we're uh, accounting for is labile carbon, this year's or last year's or the years before root material that we're going to lose. And this kind of is, you know, we kind of showed that in that earlier slide and this graph kind of shows this concept too. So in year one, that blue bar is all the carbon is that year's below ground biomass. And then, you know, the next year, about 90% of that is gone. It's decomposed or it's been eaten or it's been washed out. But we have the New Year's crop. And as you go through time, you keep adding that one year's new production and you get this at the very bottom of that core, you get that really recalcitrant carbon. And so that, you know, somewhere between four and at most maybe 10% of that initial uh, below ground production is still going to be in the sediment. Uh, in that 100 year time frame. The other thing I want to uh, quickly show you is um, some work we did about sea level rise. So that we've got erosion is one threat to marshes and of course the other is sea level rise. And we um, did a study there. We had um, a series of sites, four sites where we had paired natural marshes and um, living shoreline marshes, as you can see there, that's on the other side of uh, Pyrus Island. At each one of these, both natural, so we had eight total marshes in this study. Um, at each one of these, we put in uh, surface elevation tables or sets. These are basically benchmarks, which you can measure fine changes in elevation. We put one set down near the lower edge of the Spartina alternative flora, and another set at the upper edge of the Spartina uh, alternative flora distribution. And we measured changes in surface elevation over time. Before I get to the data, I want to show you the relative sea level rise at Beaufort, North Carolina. Our long-term sea level rise is 3.1 millimeter per year, which is similar to you know, what we're used to thinking about is happening. But during our study period, what I'll call our contemporary, contemporaneous sea level rise, 2004 to 2018 or 19, Sea level rise was seven and a half millimeters per year. And so we all know that sea level rise doesn't occur in these nice, beautiful curves we see in, you know, uh, various reports and graphical representations. It goes up and down with, as a lot of things change. Gulf Stream changes sea level rise on the East Coast. In this case, there was a, 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 a North Atlantic oscillation between the atmosphere and the ocean, which pushed up um, sea level rise all along the South Atlantic for, for a few years there. So these sets, um, the data I'm going to show you, are marshes responding to a seven and a half millimeter 
uh, sea level rise uh, from the time we put them in till the time we, we took the last measure. So maybe kind of a peek into the future. Carolyn, you've got about four minutes left. Okay. Um, so here you see uh, uh, the elevation change in the top graph, those upper sets. In the bottom graph, the lower sets, the blue dots are the sill, the orange are the natural sets, and you can clearly see the sills are accreting set at a much greater rate than are the natural marshes, and so that's good. Um, and you can see that some of our natural marshes, we actually um, lost, uh, you know, had a pretty dramatic um, erosion events. So we're getting greater accretion rate behind the sills um, because the sills kind of break the wave energy and, and uh, promote sediment accretion. However, um, what, is it enough to keep up with that seven and a half millimeter sea level rise? And here I've graphed, this is a graph with all of our sets uh, that we've measured in North Carolina. But I just wanna draw your attention to those green ovals. So those are those four um, paired uh, sill sites, sill and natural sites. And you can see that of those four sites, uh, so those are the upper and lower sets at the sill sites. You can see those four sites that only one of them were the sill, were the marshes behind the sills actually accreting at a rate fast enough to keep up with that contemporary sea level rise that they were exp experiencing. So a little bit of a caution about the long-term ability of these marshes to maintain their relative position in the tidal frame uh, over time. So finally, just my last slide, just to conclude, you know, living shorelines are um, really, I think, a, a great way to avoid this kind of coastal squeeze where you put in a bulkhead and we've got sea level rise and erosion and we just lose our marshes. And so we put in the sills or other kinds of living shorelines, which prevents erosion on the front end. Um, and, and we can, we can, our marshes can persist longer. Um, we talk a little bit about this delayed squeeze. Well, make sure that infrastructure isn't going uh, to be so close that that marsh can't migrate. But I think the other thing we have to think about a little bit is, you know, as sea level continues to rise and the lower end of, lower edge of those marshes may drown and, you know, what will, what will happen to that, uh, what will happen to that carbon? Perhaps if we've got a tow there, it'll help it persist. Um, as we reduce erosion and our long-term carbon storage, if we're really talking about 100 years, we really probably need to make sure that we are going to have high marsh uh, environments uh, in initial design that can persist into the future with sea level rise. And that's it. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Carolyn. Okay, folks, we are on to our last presenters. Um, so, um, Caroline, it looks like you're still sharing your screen. Yep, sorry. Nope, that's okay. Um, we're gonna hear now from Elliot Campbell and P uh, from DNR and Peter May from the University of Maryland. So Elliot, Peter, Elliot sharing, there you go. All right, so uh, it's good to be with you all today. Um, Elliot and I have been working on a, um, a carbon calculator for different green infrastructure projects. Uh, you know, restoration generally is, you know, thought to be a very positive thing. It's good. There are a lot of benefits to it. But one of the things we just looked at early on with stream restoration was there are these kind of hidden costs of carbon associated with restoration. And ideally, you know, you, you, you need to do work. Uh, mining and and whatnot to get uh, the materials for some of these projects, and there is that carbon cost for all of that. But uh, you know the benefits associated with the restoration, especially over time, can be uh, calculated and and extrapolated out. But one of the things that we thought we'd look at is by doing the analysis on different types of green infrastructure projects that we could. Uh, sometimes uh, reveal uh, interesting alternatives that might be useful for restoration approaches uh, to, to uh, uh, mitigate the, or reduce the, uh, the carbon impacts. Let's see, next slide there, Elliot, I guess you have control. And so, you know, we've got a lot of pictures of, of different, you know, shoreline restoration projects. Each landscape context is different. Have, this one's in Havre de Grace, or is those of us who spent a lot of time there called it Haver Disgrace, but I love the place. I grew up around there, so. <laughs> uh, 
you know, and so these projects, they get people out there involved and that's really important and they can beautify, but the, there are a lot of services involved with them uh, next. And, um, and, and, and uh, in some of these projects, you know, they can be very small and very localized and, and then also some very large scale projects that require uh, a lot more materials and, and equipment. Next slides. Um, uh, next. And uh, so, you know, scale is important and location and landscape context. And, um, and you know, if we're getting rid of bulkheads and putting in living shorelines, that's a good thing. Uh, and so for smaller scale projects, it makes sense to, you know, move that material to the site but the most efficient way you can, um, usually by road. Next slides. And, you know, some of these things are done, you know, in the back of a pickup or a few small trucks. Uh, these are bags of oyster, uh, you know, culch, it looks like spat on shell to put in a sprinkle around the site. Next. But, uh, you know, small scale amounts of materials are fine for doing uh, this work for smaller projects. But what we're interested in is some of the bigger uh, scale living shoreline projects of, you know, many hundreds, thousands of linear feet that require quite a bit of material. And, and the transport of that material, as we saw uh, with stream restoration, can be a big cost in terms of carbon and in terms of the miles and the gallons of diesel that are used. So, you know, living shorelines are by definition uh, along shorelines, right? And so they, uh, uh, you know, they have water access. That used to be the main way we used to transport things. And, um, and so we, it's kind of a back to the future thing when we're looking at these. And I'm, especially with beneficial use of dredge material, that stuff is piped and, and, and fluidized and moved to sites. But uh, for rock and sand and gravel, um, these materials, uh, especially on very large scales, not like small like this, uh, there's a large transport cost. And so we're gonna look at a different alternative uh, for that. Next slide. And I never, I grew up on Chesapeake Bay sailing, sailboat racing. Uh, uh, our boat was up in Haverty Grace and, and, and Aberdeen and Middle River and down around Annapolis. And, and so I spent a lot of time watching barges go back and forth on, bay, on the bay while I was sailing on it uh, with my family. And, I never thought I'd be looking at this from the perspective professionally, but it just makes sense uh, when you're looking at a, a here's a hypothetical project. Number numerous uh, living shoreline projects have been done. Um, actually, this is actually I made a mistake. I just made this. This was up on on the West River. Uh, I meant to do it on the Severn River, but there's a number of living shoreline projects on all of these rivers, and uh, looking at it from the perspective of, you know, there are very, there are a few quarries that actually are on the tidal uh, Chesapeake Bay, and one of them's up in Haverty Grace, and, uh, and I looked at a, a, you know, kind of a hypothetical of going to, again, to uh, a, a location, uh, living shoreline locations uh, from this quarry that, you know, to truck it is about 57 road truck miles for materials, and many, you know, many, many trucks uh, can carry much less material than say a barge can. And so if you can get that material from a quarry that happens to be on Chesapeake Bay, it's a lot more efficient to move that material. So it's 50 nautical miles by barge, 57 road uh, uh, statute miles. Actually, you do the conversions. It's exactly the same amount of distance uh, for these sites that were on the Severn River. And so, you know, if you can look at this from the perspective of, of carbon, um, you know, our typical go-to is trucks. We have these relationships and these quarries and this stuff is mined up in York, PA, Manassas, Virginia, Frederick. But um, can we start looking at these projects from the perspective of, of where are we sourcing these materials? People are familiar with food miles, right? But um, what about restoration miles or, or quarried material miles? Uh, and if we can get those to a site with a much more, in a much more efficient way uh, in larger volumes, uh, with less uh, fuel used and mileage on the roads, then that would be that would make sense. And and they're very case specific uh, and site specific. You know, you have draft issues. You need to be able to get that barge up close to the shoreline. Um, so, but we need to start thinking in these ways. If we're talking about blue carbon, living shorelines have a lot of benefits to them. Uh, carbon is one of them. And it was nice to see Carolyn, I believe, that said that you know. Put it in perspective. We're not going to blue carbon our way out of our, 
you know, our climate issues. Uh, that, but this is one of these stacked benefits we need to be considering uh, is the carbon benefit over time. But uh, at the same time, when we're doing these restoration projects, we should really also be thinking always about carbon and how we can reduce that and not just do what we have done in the past. Typically, we need to be thinking of alternatives. And if it costs a little bit more, then maybe then we should do that. And, and maybe funding entities should be looking at, hey, if you're adding a little bit more for transportation, but you're, you're, uh, but you're also reducing that carbon, that should be a, a very uh, well justified uh, uh, avenue for a higher cost, I believe. But sometimes it can be much cheaper and it ideally should be. Um, so I'll hand this over to, to Elliot here, who's going to go through some of the calculations and the data that we collected relative to uh, barge transport versus, um, versus trucking. Take it away there, Elliot. And I think you're muted. Okay, there we go. There we go. Audio share for some reason. Okay. <clears throat> and you're still seeing my screen, right? Yes. Excellent. <clears throat> so thank you for that that introduction, Peter. I think that was really set the stage well. So <clears throat> I'm gonna show some kind of a hypothetical living shoreline based on um, a some prior calculations that, that DNR did for a completely different reason, but uh, I was able to repurpose um, that kind of hypothetical study that was done to look at uh, kind of the employment benefits for a living shoreline construction project. Um, and it uh, coincidentally had a lot of the data that we needed to uh, calculate the kind of carbon intensity, carbon footprint, emissions associated with the project. I'm gonna use all those terms somewhat in interchangeably. Um, <clears throat> so here's that, again, generic uh, living shoreline project, one acre, it would be you know, a relatively uh, carbon intensive project um, with, well, materials intensive project, quite a bit of rock, sand. Uh, and this um, project, it was the, it was transported in by barge. We're going to look at um, that barge versus truck uh, comparison and, and then look at different um, transport distances and how that impacts carbon. Um, there's the construction time. So we accounted for uh, the emissions associated with the construction itself, running the heavy machinery, that sort of, that sort of thing. <clears throat> so, Again, this is a, a generic living shoreline. It's a, approximately an acre, uh, approximately a thousand linear feet. <clears throat> and then we're gonna look at that 50 miles of that theoretical situation that Peter uh, laid out. So <clears throat> if you kind of just do the math that's associated with, first off with mining the materials, there's quite a bit of carbon that is involved in that phase of the life cycle uh, of one of these projects. So for that, and for all these uh, these numbers, there we basically just went to the literature to find um, prior studies that have, have done this work. Um, we should have set it up that this is part of a, a larger project where we're looking at specific uh, restoration projects, not just living shorelines, stream restorations, tree plantings, um, stormwater. Uh, infrastructure and looking at specific projects with specific data. But for this one, it's this theoretical um, situation. Uh, so for in the barge transport, you can see the emissions associated with that are uh, a small percentage of, of the overall um, <clears throat> CO2 emissions. So I'll show a um, pie chart in a second that makes it a little more evident. Whereas uh, if you transport the materials through trucking, it's quite a bit higher as a percentage of the total. So from a <clears throat> more clear uh, visual perspective, you can see the barge transport is only about 7% of the total CO2 emissions um, versus if you transport it through truck, it's around 25%. So there's, you know, an obvious significant um, 
carbon savings of, of barge transport. There's certainly, and I sh should also clarify that, you know, we're not trying to say, um, you know, we're not trying to point fingers at anybody doing projects one, one way or the other. And we certainly acknowledge there's uh, conditions that would perhaps require truck transport versus barges. This is just, again, a, a theoretical example. So <clears throat> let's take a look at the distance that a, the materials are sourced from. <clears throat> um, a look, we looked at four miles, 10 miles, 50 miles, and, and 100 miles. And, and this is you know, relatively obvious. Uh, <clears throat> if you're able to source the materials from a closer distance, you uh, save a tremendous amount of diesel uh, fuel and CO2 emissions. So the four miles, that's not really a realistic um, situation in, in most cases. Um, there's not a whole lot of quarries that are that are right next to uh, areas that are living, being built as living shorelines. Um, but where it, it could be a realistic uh, condition would be if you were to be sourcing the material from a beneficial use um, project. So if you were, you know, doing a dredge where you were had sandy material and were able to um, either barge or pipe that over to your living shoreline, that again would have tremendous carbon savings. Um, and here again is just a graphical description of uh, of those results that I just showed in a table form. Sometimes it's nice, it's just nice to see the relative values in, in the bars, right? Um, I can I can figure out in uh, Google Sheets how to get the a secondary axis, but the relative differences in CO2 emissions are the same as the relative differences in uh, diesel use. So <clears throat> from the, the benefit side, and, and Carolyn just gave a really nice presentation on with a, a lot of uh, this type of data, um, <clears throat> carbon sequestration and, and the storage associated with coastal marshes. So, <clears throat> and, and as she showed from the sequestration side, um, it's significant, but it you know takes time to develop over. It, it takes time to, to develop the sequestration, um, and then there's another big factor <clears throat> with carbon sequestration in coastal marshes, which is uh, methane emissions. I'm presenting some some data that my colleague Rachel Marks um, pulled together through through literature review and, and some modeling um, <clears throat> for the net CO2 emissions uh, per acre per year associated with different uh, salinity regimes in the bay. So <clears throat> in, in these data, we found that uh, tidal freshwater marshes were actually a net uh, emitter of CO2. Um, Whereas you go down to the mesohaline, we really don't have polyhaline in Maryland, except for, I guess, the, the coastal bays. Um, <clears throat> but a mesohaline was a positive, and oligohaline was just about broke even. Um, so that's a significant factor. There's a lot of other variability there. Um, some recent work has shown that plant communities can, can make a difference, but uh, that's kind of a, a general trend. Yeah, and I, I'll just jump in. I should say that uh, you know that 500 uh, metric tons of CO2 per per acre, uh, you know, per year. That that's that's an extreme high end that this paper uh, cited. Uh, but you know, there are uh, plenty of studies that show about one a one metric ton per acre per year of of uh, Spartina salt marsh over like a very oh. old hundred year old marsh. And so there's a huge yeah. range in terms of that storage. Yeah. Yeah, so this this is a was a value of the so stored, not not um, sequestered per year. Oh, right, okay, right, right. right. So this is like the total amount of carbon that was stored in the marsh, um, <clears throat> whereas these values in the in the um, graph are, are annual annual values. Sorry, that wasn't that wasn't clear, um, <clears throat> but the. That being said, if you're doing a living shoreline and protecting, okay, can you draw a please? 
<laughs> of course, but right. I, she hasn't come and uh, said anything to me for hours. And then right when I'm presenting, she'll just comes out to the lounge. But um, <clears throat> so if you're doing a living shoreline and you're protecting, uh, let's do a hypothetical, you're protecting an acre of, of coastal wetlands that has that 500 metric tons of CO2. That's a, essentially equal to the the cost uh, per acre of of putting in the living shoreline. So, um, it's not it's not as simple as that comparison. Uh, and, and Carolyn went over how you know what the the carbon fate of some of those coastal wetlands are that we're is that we're losing. But um, it's just kind of a, a simple hypothetical. Um, and then again to um, Kind of look at what the alternative is <clears throat> you know we're there's high rates of uh, erosion in these areas that living shorelines are going in and the t alternative is typically um, some type of bulkhead or rip wrapping the shoreline that sort of thing and that's going to require in and we didn't actually go through and do this uh, do the calculation but if you just look at the embodied carbon of the type of materials that are uh, typically used for coastal armoring. It's quite a bit higher than than the stone and sand that you'd be using for uh, for living shorelines. So, um, in a couple of examples I found from Europe, it was almost an order of magnitude higher than what you would we would observe the living shoreline. But those were kind of more extreme situations where it was almost a, a seawall being built. But <clears throat> um, but still, that that needs to be a consideration. Um, and then as we're starting to wrap up here, and I, I threw this in, there was a really excellent NOAA seminar series on Phragmites um, with some researchers out of Rutgers and, uh, and elsewhere. But they were essentially extolling the, birth, the benefits of Phragmites. Uh, and Peter's put a, a graphic from the Friends of Phragmites uh, group at University of Maryland. Um, so we typically, we spend a lot of time and effort in, and associated greenhouse gas emissions uh, to remove Phragmites when we're doing restoration or, or the department even requires it as some, for some of our easements. Um, but if we look at the plant itself and, and it, its uh, ecological values, they're can be significant. It yeah, has sequestration rates that can be up to five times those of, of some native species assemblages. Um, it's really effective at stabilizing shorelines, uh, attenuating wave energy, and uptaking uptaking nutrients. So it's um, you know has all these good ecosystem services that we we care about, but it, it is an invasive. And then it's oftentimes referred to as a as an ecological desert, <clears throat> but but looking at the literature, it's it's quite mixed. Um, I've seen several studies that don't find a statistical difference between um, bird or macro invertebrate species richness or abundance. Um, but if you are, that being said, if you want uh, to create you know habitat for the salt marsh sparrow, it's it's not going to do that right. So in certain situations where you're going after um, the restoration specifically for wildlife habitat, you may want to put that effort into controlling Phragmites. Um, and then to wrap up, Peter, do you want to do you want to do this last slide? Yeah. So, you know, when possible, barge in those materials. You know, draft is a consideration. Uh, you know, context. Some of these shorelines are in very shallow water areas where you might not be able to do this, but uh, when you can, let's think about it. And and they are being done in this way. Um, but uh, you know, uh, you know the beneficial uses of dredge material. Um, you know that can help align and timing some of these projects. Some of it's just timing, right? And uh, isn't all of life just about timing? But uh, but trying to time some of these projects and match them, uh, pair them up with uh, beneficial use uh, would be is a great way to go. Um, Utilize designs that use less rock, you know, the embodied energy is lower than concrete. Uh, but when you look at the whole overall uh, uh, project, perhaps uh, uh, utilizing, say, uh, larger spat set oyster reef balls uh, to create offshore breakwaters where they make sense. Uh, you can only build them up to a certain size, but 
you know, those would provide kind of that wave interruption. I tried to fit one of those into a project, uh, but it wasn't permitted for other reasons. But maybe we need to think about that uh, to replace some of that uh, for uh, wave energy disruption. Um, uh, integrate marsh creation into your design, which you're doing anyway, most people do. But the frag, where it makes sense, if you're, if you have a, uh, it's a, it's, it's kind of standard to do this for most projects. You got to eliminate all the invasives, but maybe we need to think about this uh, a little bit more for where it makes sense, uh, where it's already in existence, uh, that uh, the cost of, of removing it to try to push something in there uh, that we'd like to see, uh, maybe that benefit, let's start looking at some of these uh, additional benefits of FRAG. Uh, it sounds anathema to many people, but um, but sometimes that might be the best, you know, working with nature, uh, you know, can be can be a better way to go. And that's ecological engineering right there. Great. Last time, just our contact information. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Elliot and Peter. Thank you guys so much. All right, folks. Um, we are now gonna to transition to our panel, um, which is basically everyone you just heard speak um, is going to be answering some of the questions that came in through the chat. If you have additional questions, please continue to put them in the chat. I'm working with Nicole um, behind the scenes to make sure that she has the questions and, and that we can facilitate this panel. We're gonna run this panel until 4.25 um, and then we'll wrap up a little bit and then we'll get you out of here right at 4.30. Um, and Thank you for uh, sticking around. So Nicole is going to facilitate this panel, um, but if you have more questions, drop them in the chat. Um, and Nicole, it is yours. Thank you, Allison. I'm just going to ask for everyone who spoke today to just turn your camera on so we can see everybody. Um, and we're going to get started. I wanted to start with some of the project or some of the questions we had related to living shoreline design. Um, so one of the first questions we had was, what role do hardened structures like riprap play in living shorelines? And how do they prevent or hinder marsh migration? And I thought this was pretty relevant in working in um, a world with sea level rise and with marsh migration being pretty important. Um, so this, I guess I'll open this question up to um, Kevin, Al, Wes, and any others who might want to speak to this topic. I can just start out if you want me to. Um, rock is usually twice as expensive as sand. So from a cost side, it's good to minimize rock, maximize sand and plants. I mean, that, that's what we're all going for. However, rock is needed for high energy settings. I mean, it's just, you get, but you gotta redirect the wave. So um, I would say uh, that uh, rock is more the bones of the living shoreline, gives you structure and gives you ways to direct the energy where you want it to go. So, uh, but, but then again, too, back in the day, we used to build these sill structures. I think Wes was showing it, these Berlin walls <laughs> paralleling the coast. And so, you know, it's just, you, you, we gotta, gotta be judicious, you know, when we, when we use, when we use rock. So I'll, that, that's my two cents worth. Kevin, uh, Wes. Yeah, thanks, Albert. Um, it was interesting, that question right after listening to, to Elliot's, um, presentation there. So um, yeah, I, I agree with Albert, you know, you're going to utilize rock to some degree, but to what degree are you going to utilize it? And the fact is, is that I think for the last 20 years or so, we've been trying to really figure out, you know, the strategic placement of these materials so that they can, you know, so you can get the most effective use of rock and other hardened structures. I mean, we're, we're trying to minimize it, not only because, you know, you talk about how it limits marsh migration, but rock also limits um, the, uh, uh, the, the use by aquatic organisms and, and critters. So, you know, you really want to limit it to the degree that you can, understanding that it's going to be necessary in order to pin things in place, and like Albert said, the backbone. But, um, but I think being really strategic about it is important. Yeah, and I would just add on to that, but it also it limits that whole coastal process that we, we talked about earlier. You know, some of the smaller particles move around a little bit, a little bit better. So, um, you know, living shoreline is not living if it's not moving. Right, right Kevin? 
Thanks, right class. <laughs> Thanks, Kevin and Albert. Um, I thought this was interesting. Peter talked a little bit about using oyster reef balls in his last slide. So one of the questions we had um, that came in during registration was, what role can oysters play in keeping pace with sea level rise? And um, what role can they play in living shoreline design and habitat restoration? I'll, I'll and, just, well, whatever, I'll just be real quick. You know, uh, uh, live, uh, nature's components, in other words, moisture reefs back in the days acted as submerged breakwaters. You know, they were cemented, submerged systems that actually helped attenuate waves coming in and reaching the shoreline. Um, currently, if you add reef balls in there, they will give you wave attenuation capabilities, but I really think it's a twofer. You have the, the, the habitat piece and also the wave attenuation piece. So in the grand scheme of things, you know, the overall strategy coming up with living shoreline kind of makes it behave as you want to. Then you add the habitat features into it. The other part is woody structure too. Okay. I, I, I just add to that, uh, Nicole, that um, they, they can play a really important component uh, as part of a project, uh, depending on where you are too. And that's gonna have a really big determination as to whether or not it's gonna be effective. But, you know, it's instructive. I would ask everybody to go back and look at the Yates, I think it's Yates, the Yates maps that were done in like 1901 where they mapped the, uh, the oyster reefs around the bay. It's really incredible to see what existed at that particular point in time. But on the other stand, on the on the other hand, also recognize that we probably don't get this kind of production, particularly um, above mean low water uh, production that they get like down in the Carolinas, where you know they're probably a little bit more effective, but but still an important part of a of a project certainly. And, and I'll just say the project I was proposing them on, uh, I had looked at the fetch and kind of the, the boat traffic that creates most of that fetch. It's not just nor'easters, which, you know, there was a lot of fetch, but, uh, but that regular boat traffic was producing one, you know, one foot waves regularly throughout the year, almost all the time. And by putting uh, an oyster reef ball that came up basically just to, you know, the edge of mean low water up into mean, mean, uh, that those were able to intersect conceptually by clustering them in a checkerboard pattern, you were able to intercept and, and break that wave energy because the wave, that energy is below the surface water too, right? Equal to, that's the physics of waves. And so by interrupting that, it doesn't have to be super tidal. It just has to be at that point where a one foot wave or plus moving through is intercepted by that and it breaks that energy right before it hits the shoreline. And having them try to mimic, again, looking to nature for those solutions, and you're absolutely right, those, those three-dimensional reefs were the uh, breakwaters for all these marshes. And so maybe we need to start thinking about um, living shorelines, maybe coupled where it makes sense, like on the Severn River, there's still spat setting naturally on structures. So why don't we think about setting the stage with a biogenic material infused in reef balls, which has a better chemical signature for spat set, right? Instead of bluestone, which they don't necessarily like as much. And so by thinking about that and the ecologies of oysters and 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 looking back, you know, looking in the past for this future, maybe we start considering uh, where it makes sense uh, living shorelines coupled with. Uh, three-dimensional reef uh, structures that are, you know, sprinkled with spat, you know, reef balls, spats at reef balls, or, uh, you know, concrete rubble that's then creating the three-dimensional structure and then trying to uh, work towards a reef that can, uh, that is in some proximity to uh, existing oyster reefs or sanctuaries that would be able to set on them and create a better uh, offshore breakwater than a pile of bluestone, window pane bluestone. I, I was going to just add one thing to that, and, and I think that's that's great. That's that's right. So in North Carolina, most of our oysters, at least from the middle of the coast down, are intertidal. So they are an integral part of many, many living shorelines. In fact, probably when living shorelines first started get really getting popular in North Carolina, it was using bagged oyster shell. 
But there has been some research that I wanted to mention. Someone asked a specific question about oysters keeping up with sea level rise. And Justin Ridge and Tony Rodriguez have published a couple papers demonstrating that oysters do um, accrete vertically and can maintain their position uh, in, in, in the tidal frame. And so maybe with global warming, you guys will have intertidal oysters one day. I don't know. Well, we did in the past, right? I don't know how they could, maybe they, maybe they existed, but then during warm periods, but they died off and who knows, but they, they used to be there, right? Well, I, let me give you just an example though, because, you know, I agree with everything everyone's saying, but there are some realities that you have to uh, face here. And that is, and Albert, I'm going to talk about the uh, Horsehead Project um, uh, over at Steebeck where we actually did that, we used the rubble from the demolition of, um, of Memorial Stadium uh, to create that three-dimensional structure. Um, and where we wanted to put that offshore, we couldn't because there were SAVs growing there. So we ended up having to push it out further into about four feet of water, uh, which was about 600 feet offshore, where we put the, uh, the, the, uh, the reef. Now, the reef did really well with oysters and a whole host of other organisms. So it really, I think, is a benefit for a number of different reasons. But because we had to push it so far offshore, we probably didn't get the wave attenuation that we were hoping to get. So there are realities about, you know, impacts to other, uh, you know, regulated uh, areas that, uh, you know, come into play here. So um, these are always the things we're always weighing and, and, and fiddling with when you do these types of projects. Thanks everyone. Um, yeah, I think it's hard to talk about living shorelines without talking about oysters and also without talking about SAV. We did have a question in the chat that I think was for Tammy. Um, and Cindy, you might be able to also address this a little bit, but um, the question was how might the new changes to the category B SAV impacts during living shorelines permitting affect SAV restoration goals? I don't want to always keep talking, but I'll throw my, my two cents worth in one more time. Um, I, I, oh, I'm sorry, it's Tammy. Never mind, Tammy. I didn't know. I, go ahead, Tammy. No, 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 sorry. It just took me a while to, to get to the to the mute button. Sorry. Um, no, you know, so we, we actually um, are pulling some numbers now and, and taking a look at like, what are the percentages of projects that actually impact SAV? It, it's, it's pretty minimal. Um, those projects that are really um, impacting SAV, so we're, we're not anticipating that that's going to, to really impact it. And also, it's not that the core is not going to be reviewing it. It just now will fall under um, a category B activity. And um, so it'll be able to be issued, um, you know, quicker than what it would be in the past where an individual permit was required by the core and required, you know, that, uh, the topic that I didn't go down before was a water quality certification. So it, it's not saying, I don't see anything changing with like projects that we were and were not. I think it, it will just impact the processing time of an application. So that's the only change I see. It's not that the core wasn't issuing those impacts before. It um, it was just it had to go through a different process that had some more additional steps that just took longer. Yeah, and I was pausing because I don't really know what category B is versus any of the other categories. <laughs> so that's definitely a Tammy question. <laughs> so uh, I would probably, uh, my understanding is obviously not nearly as great as Tammy's. Um, yeah, I mean, there's definitely like, I don't think that we can ignore it, but it used to be that it was like a full stop, like really hard kind of thing. And I just don't see evidence for that, at least in the data that we have. I think that the thing that they can coexist. And in fact, actually from a sediment perspective, it's probably better to have both together actually, because then they could help each other out in a way. Um, but that's something that we're looking at in, and actually this project that we're doing in the coastal bays, that's part of it is looking at the exchange between SAB if it's there and the marshes to try to understand those synergies a little bit better. Thank you. Um, we had another question that had come in during registration and I think um, some folks were interested in how practitioners can design for sea level rise. 
uh, storm surge and these more intense, uh, more frequent storm events and how marsh migration might play a role in the design of these, uh, these practices. Um, so I guess that would be a question for Wes, Kevin, or Albert. I think Albert's the only practitioner. Yeah. Yeah, well, we're all in this together, guys. Okay. <laughs> right. so, um, the, uh, you know, when, when I'm looking at the, uh, for, for looking at sea level rise and also storm waves, uh, it's usually setting the top of the practice elevation. That, that's why, that's what I look at. Uh, and you know, uh, basically, if you're shooting for a target of 2050 or 2100, uh, then the, whatever those elevation projections are, that's where the height of the practice should be for the protection piece. Um, for uh, stone, stone versus sand. Sand, sand can self-adjust. If you get the stone right or you know, the you know, way the you get everything laid out correctly, um, what's nifty about sand you know, it will actually adjust to the conditions and also allows, I call it the handicap ramp for the marsh to transition landward, which is an important piece too. So um, that, that, but then again, too, I mean, you say all this and then let's say you have like a, some sort of uh, infrastructure you can't encroach upon, you know, there, there's like these other pieces or variables you have to deal with too. So that's, that's all I had to say. And Nicole, Nicole, uh, Carolyn had a really great slide in her presentation, which basically showed, you know, looking at the back beach area, you know. So when you're doing living shoreline work, and we've learned this over the years too, which is, you know, let's not just look at the shoreline, let's look back behind the shoreline too, because sometimes you have flows coming in and things like that. And you really need to kind of integrate the shoreline into whether it's an upland, uh, upland system or a dunal system but you know what's behind and and do you have room to move or can you accommodate that sometimes it, it's really difficult to do because of there's a road or whatever but um you know when you have that opportunity that's what you really need to look at and the opportunity for those for those areas to migrate great thank you both um there were also some questions in the chat related to blue carbon um, and salinity. So I know that there was some dialogue in the chat, but I thought it was worthwhile to bring that up um, to the panel. Um, the question was what, well, the questions were around, what is the role of salinity in living shoreline feasibility and carbon storages and carbon storage? Um, and there are questions related to carbon storage in wetlands and carbon storage in SAV. So I didn't know if folks wanted to touch on how salinity um, is taken into account uh, within the living shoreline process and how it's taken into account when quantifying the carbon uh, storage. I can take a crack at that. And I did have put a little bit of information in the chat. So um, early on, I mentioned that it was the anaerobic saline sediments that made marshes and seagrasses and mangroves so effective at carbon sequestration because the microbial decomposition pathways, when there's sulfate, when there's seawater, it's sulfate reduction, which ends up with CO2. So CO2 in, CO2 out, one to one in terms of global warming potential or CO2 equivalents. But in a freshwater system, there's no sulfate. And so the terminal microbial decomposition process um, uh, results in methanogenesis. So there's methane instead of CO2 when that organic material decomposes. And methane has a much greater, what they call global warming potential. It traps heat 25 times more over a century, I think is the factor that they use. So that that's really the issue with salinity. If there's salinity in the system, you've got sulfate, you've got sulfate reduction as your terminal decomposition pathway instead of methanogenesis. Um, so, you know, freshwater wetlands and freshwater SAV, a lot of times, the, you know, the net, the, you know, when they do the net annual carbon CO2 equivalents that comes out is not a sink. It doesn't mean they don't have car buried carbon stocks. Someone asked that question. There is still buried carbon. There's still carbon underneath those systems that is valuable and that we don't want them to go away because then it'll, you know, it'll add to carbon when it erodes. 
but that's 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 kind of the, the issue around salinity. And so there's opportunities, for example, if you've got where tidal flow has been restricted into a wetland and it's freshened up or brackished up, if you can restore that tidal flow, um, there's a lot of talk about that being a really effective way to increase carbon sequestration of a system is just by restoring it from a brackish or freshwater marsh into a, a saline system. Great, thanks. Yeah, I think there were some questions in the chat about that. And I think that that was a wonderful explanation. Um, there, uh, there was one other comment related to the oyster, uh, the oyster discussion. And the question was, what is the advantage of an oyster ball versus having oyster substrate on, on the bottom of a river? I'll just, I'll say that, you know, it's, it's three-dimensional, you know, it's the wave uh, energy interruption. So, you know, if you're, if you're building a three-dimensional oyster reef uh, that has the same profile to intercept that wave energy, then that, that's, that's ideally, I would think even better. Um, you know, reef balls, uh, at least I tried to program them into a Severn River living shoreline design because the, the depth was right, you know, for the largest reef ball actually just peaked out a little bit above uh, mean higher high water. Uh, and and it made sense. You could build them very cheaply, a lot cheaper than and, and put them in place and 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 spat setting would be great. Uh, so you can do that. I would say that to create a three dimensional reef with material base and then covering with uh, with oyster culch, spat set culch uh, is good. Uh, it's probably a little more expensive, but uh, if that's what you are interested in doing and can build that into your project, I think that would be ideal. The other alternative, I think, and that was something I was conceptualizing, was using these reef balls, but then getting into a, you know, they, they when they're all clustered together in a checkerboard, you'd have this, you know, these gaps, and maybe you could be uh, you know, continually doing uh, with a neighboring community, uh, uh, oyster spat set, you know, bags to nurse and then uh, get the community involved with putting them out every year and building your own reef with kind of that loose base of a reef ball. And uh, uh, so these are experimental things and ideas. And, and I think we just need to try some more of them and maybe partner with, uh, you know, river associations and whatnot to try some of these things with communities that would be Take ownership of them and and uh, and over time build that reef, right? And also collect data on how well they're performing, you know, and how much they're maybe attracting new spat from an offshore reef somewhere. Nicole, I think one of the other things to look at is um, is the uh, aquaculture feed people. You know, the folks who are growing oysters in aquaculture. You know, I mean, their whole purpose is to grow oysters, right? They want to grow them quickly. And, um, and if you look at how they do it, in a lot of cases, they do it in suspended cages. And, uh, you know, it's more of a three-dimensional, uh, just as Peter was saying, it's more three-dimensional, circulation's better, sunlight might have something to do with it. And, um, you know, so, you know, you got to get them up off the bottom. And, uh, and I think that's really, so the three-dimensional part is really important. Great, thank you. Um, we did just have a question in the chat related to challenges for implementation. And I know Albert and Kevin spoke to some of the challenges um, around aligning regulatory and environmental and community needs to really get these projects on the ground. And there were some also, so also some other questions in the chat regarding challenges around land ownership and SAV impact. So, um, I think we have about five minutes left today. So I'm wondering if um, folks want to comment on maybe what you see as the greatest challenges for living shoreline implementation, especially in a time where our climate is changing or to comment on any opportunities uh, for research or innovation to address those challenges. So um, I, I don't know if we wanna go down the panel or folks wanna volunteer their thoughts as we close out today's webinar. I'll, I'll just be real quick. I mean, basically, you know, the owner is the one that will be paying for the project. So early on at the very upfront part, you have to listen intently and actively 
and then guide them along the way. Now, I'd say owner is in singular. When you have owners, then it becomes exponentially more um, challenging. I'll stop there. <laughs> yeah. And along that same line of thought, like a, a lot of times we'll go out to site visits, you know, in Baltimore County where you have a really urban area and, you know, they're working with 50 feet of shoreline. So ideally we'd like to do a reach scale project. So it's kind of, it goes hand in hand. It's like, we'd, we'd like to do a reach scale communities. You have more voices for the same piece of property. Um, so it's just kind of one of those things you have to, yeah, first listen to the property owner, of course, they may uh, not even be interested in thinking about a living shoreline, um, spend your time wisely. Um, but yeah, along the same lines. Nicole, I'll just be real quick and say that, you know, one thing we ought to think about is, is where we've come in the last 20 to 30 years. It's a pretty significant way that we've traveled in terms of, you know, what we were doing then and what we're doing today. And it's really great, um, you know, to see us, you know, we're working in these high energy environments, you know, with living shorelines and having success. And um, so, so that's, that's really great. And so, you know, I think we're always challenged to come up with better ways to really integrate the habitat with the protection and, uh, it's the challenge and I think the fun part of this whole business. I'd love to just quickly say that I think data collection as built should be a requirement, uh, you know, and I think that there should be some mechanism, I think, for revisiting after one, three, five, ten years to look at these projects and learn from them or maybe go back and look at old ones. But if you don't know where they were exactly when you finish them, you're not gonna be able to tell what happened, right? We have all these great visuals of a 1942 shoreline. Why, that should be a mandated requirement of practitioners to institute that uh, as part of their permits, I believe. So we can actually go back and determine how well they're actually functioning from a, just a hydrophysical, geophysical, perspective not but then there's the ecology right and so more data should be collected to learn performance and not just well it looks good or hmm. <laughs> so I, I have to chime in uh, Peter on that one because I agree that more data would be great but don't put it on the uh, on, on the folks who are trying to do it because it's just going to be another incentive for them not to it's going to be an additional cost living shorelines you know certainly are probably more expensive to do than traditional shoreline practices. So we don't want to put an additional cost and an additional disincentive on folks to do that. I agree with you that getting that data is important, but maybe it should be on somebody else. It should be someone else's responsibility. Well, project specific, if it's just a single homeowner, landowner, that's one thing, but like a, a community project or something that's a larger scale, that's, you know, got a, that, that, that I would, agree with you when it's, you know, grant funded for a larger scale community, right. you know, individual homeowners. Yes, we want to encourage them. We don't want to, but I'm saying these larger projects uh, that involve DNR, you know, millions, uh, those should be required and maybe they already do, but I, I think a lot of projects don't get as built survey done on them. And that's a shame, especially for something that can change so much over time, like a living shoreline. Well, your point is well taken. Yeah. I was going to sort of say the same thing about data, but different, same and, and different, um, in that it's a real challenge, right? Um, and I'm just going to set aside the funding issue because that is really, at least in my experience, the limiting factor here. Um, but just in a pretend world where I got to have all the money I wanted and I could play with living shorelines, um, it's really fascinating to me that we have had living shorelines installed all throughout the Bay for decades. And we still... The, our experience with how well they do is still quite anecdotal and quite like I saw that that worked over there kind of thing. Um, and so I think really doing much, much better um, long-term performance stuff not only helps convince property owners to put it in, like they want to know it's going to work and it's going to stick around and it's going to help them out in some way. Um, if we could figure out how to get nutrient credits, that would be awesome because that would further incentivize them. Um, and, and really like getting at the mechanisms of why. And I think that that would help with improving designs as we go forward. 
um, so that it was a little bit more um, understandable as we go forward. Any other final thoughts before I turn things back over to Allison? I would just I just say a, a concern and I think a, a challenge would be the, the long term prospects. We often bill living shorelines as, as lasting forever, right? And they're designed to be able to keep up with sea level rise. But as uh, you look in you know, 30, 40, 50 years down the road and sea level rise is really accelerating, are these systems uh, really going to be able to keep up with that. So that's a concern of mine, at least. But but remember this, and that is that for years, years, we've been building bulkheads, revetments, and nobody's doing any studies on those, very little. So, you know, we say they're, they're not good, but there's actually very little study done on that. So let's not... I think we can all agree that living shorelines are probably a positive way to go. Um, but let's not, you know, what do they say? Put the, go, uh, go for the perfect um, because nothing's perfect. But, you know, we just have a lot of revetment and bulkhead out there and we think it's bad, but you know what? There's not a whole lot of research on it, quite honestly. So it's interesting. Thanks everyone for your participation. These are some great thoughts and a great discussion. I'm gonna turn things back over to Allison. Thank you, Nicole. And thank you, um, a big thank you to all of our presenters, um, Rachel and Elliot, um, Nicole, um, and everyone else who helped us get this agenda set and our speakers in line um, for today. So I'm gonna be very mindful of our time. It's been a long afternoon. There will be some follow-ups. We are posting this webinar. Um, online along with the other two. Um, and we hope in the coming month or so that there'll be some follow-ups following the collective um, webinar series. So if you have any follow-up questions, please feel free to email me. Um, I'll put my email in the chat really quick. Um, but I just wanna take a moment to really say thank you to everyone, our participants. Um, we had a really great turnout today and really great engagement. And um, we look forward to these conversations continuing in the coming months. So with that, um, hope everyone has a great afternoon. And thanks for sticking with us.